This is incredible. As we stand by for the start. 15 seconds. As we see that that arrow formation uh, of the Pacers that we, we talked about in our earlier meetings, what's the significance of, of the style uh, that we see the Pacers in this, this sort of three at the front, three along the back? Well, we, we talked about the nerves uh, and the anticipation of, of the, the three runners, um, but the Pacers would have had a huge amount of, of nerves and adrenaline coursing through them to get into this formation. So we can see at the front there, that that's actually Chris Derrick at the front, and I think it's it's Andrew Bombalova behind him and Sam Schlanger alongside him. They'll be the front three, and then the other three guys in, in a line behind them, they will be the second stage. So after the first loop, which actually will be a little bit shorter because they started on the back straight. So when they come through with 17 laps to go the front three will peel off and the back three will move forward into that triangle formation and another three guys will come in and, and sort of have another lap to get themselves on pace the idea being that then they hit the pace perfectly and that's, that's going to be the key factor here today is that the three athletes attempting the the barrier um, they have perfect strategy they're not allowed to go too fast so they can't mess up their pacing by going f too fast too soon they're held to what we hope is the perfect pace to break through the barrier what kind of responsibility do do these pacers have as opposed in to a, to a, a normal style race well as we said earlier all the major marathons have pacers and they feel the same sort of responsibility. They're often training partners of the athletes in the different major marathons where they're doing pacing. Uh, here it's a little bit different in the sense that there's a very precise goal of hitting, as Paula said, the exact time frames. They want to hit 250 per kilometer, uh, around 434 per mile, around 1413 per 5K. Very precise planning around those times, even pacing uh, throughout. And the goal of that, of course, is to get to the halfway mark on pace and then go from there. Mindset-wise, not uh, being in a position where you're economizing uh, what your splits are going to look like, but really being let these athletes being let go, send it from the get-go. What do you think that's like sort of for their mindset to, to switch from what they're used to? Well, I mean, they're pretty used to, to being dialed into to performing from, from the go. Um, it's a little bit more unique here because they're not actually racing to particularly win the race, although let's not get that confused from the start. Every one of these guys wants to be the first person to break through that barrier, and they want to be the first person across the line. So they are racing as well, but they're really focused on laying it all on the line and trying to, to commit from the beginning to basically what we call in marathon running kind of red line it the whole way which is hold it on that line uh, of the lactate threshold so that you're maintaining pretty much as fast as you can go at, in an even pace over the race without tipping over that line and here you see that first change of the pacers coming in that will take place on a regular basis the basic format is that each pacer will run a 5k before they go out and get a rest of about 26 to 28 minutes. They'll do half of that distance or one lap in the V-shape in the front and the other half across a line behind that V-shape. As Paula mentioned, they've been practicing all week and, and those pacers take a great deal of responsibility for this. They feel like they're an important part of this, which they are, and their training has reflected that. So that's, sorry, I was just going to say that's the first changeover done smoothly, which is kind of what we wanted to see and what we wanted to see them relaxed into. It's probably also worth pointing out that the line is actually a big help to them too because the green line you can see projected there is basically where they need to keep up to. So that's a big help for these paces. It's not like on a track where they're going through every 100 meters and they can see the splits. So to hit it perfectly, they're getting a little bit of help there. 
And the exact formation, this V-shape in front and the line across, that was developed from studies that were done in a wind tunnel at the University of New Hampshire. So they took groups of athletes into the wind tunnel. They tried different ways. And they also have informed the athletes, where's the best place for them to stand behind the pacers to get the maximum drafting capabilities? I found it interesting that uh, Zersene started his watch at the start. He didn't trust the very sophisticated <laughs> timing that we have here. You see that pace car uh, at the front there that is uh, being precision driven because that pace car needs to stay at a specific speed. Well, there are actually two drivers, one to steer and one to keep the pace proper. Two years in the making. We spoke about uh, the science that has gone into this and these athletes have been working in tandem with those scientists to get to this moment in which we try and see if we can s see what's on the other side of the human spirit and get below these two hours and possibly make history. human endeavor why would you try to climb Everest why would you try to go to the moon it's about the journey it's about learning what our capabilities are that Bill Bowerman quote the real purpose of running isn't to win a race it's to test the limits of the human heart it is uh, it's powerful there are a lot of a lot of people and critics who might say well, if you don't know that it can be done, and it's never been done before, why go through all of this? Why, why do this if you risk maybe perhaps not getting to that barrier? Well, I think that's what these guys do every day. Um, and what every athlete, no matter what level you're at, everybody wants to, to see where their potential lies, to see just how fast they can run and see what they can do. I know that's what I wanted to do through my career was finish and look back and say, okay, that was as good as I was capable of doing. So for these guys to get that opportunity to have the whole science background behind them, and that's another factor that's so fascinating in all of this, is we can look at all the sciences and we can do all the numbers and all the calculations but these guys are human, and now we're actually going to see what a human being can do. And sometimes that doesn't always tally with the science. Sometimes they can go beyond that, and they're getting the chance to, to really test that limit. Yeah, sometimes athletes, and I'm sure you've gone through this in your career, where you might be criticized for your belief, for your actual belief in yourself and what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. um, and now to be able to have scientists say, I will take your belief, 
will plug in uh, science and help you get to the place where that belief can be actuated. And one of the things that went into choosing these three athletes was that they embraced this. They, weren't, they didn't have to have their arm twisted. No one had to tell them, you must do this. They saw the potential of this, and I think Paula says it, you know, beautiful insight. This was another kind of challenge for them. You know, they, they'd, they'd set world records in the case of Zersene. They, they'd won major marathons, uh, the other two. But this was different, and this was something new for them that would motivate them, motivate their team, motivate their coach, their group, and they were really part of something. And to me, again, it harkens back to uh, the early 50s when people were chasing after the first sub-four-minute mile, when scientists at that time were not the friends of the athletes. Scientists were telling athletes their heart might explode if they broke four minutes because people had been trying to break four minutes since the first man broke 4.10. Jules Laudemake from France in 1929. So for more than 20 years, people had been trying to break that barrier unsuccessfully. But someone like Roger Bannister, himself a scientist, was able to embrace the possibility. He didn't believe in the limits, and he was able to become the first man to break four minutes. As we see a nice shot of the Pacers, we, we saw those scientists in the, in the piece, uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Skiba, uh, Dr. Wilkins, and Dr. Brett Kirby. You, Paula, you've had a chance to, to work with some of them, correct? Yeah, I, I worked with, with Dr. Andy Jones um, through through my career. He actually started helping me out prior to, to winning the World Cross Country Junior title, back way back in, in end of 1991 when I was I was actually anemic at the time, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. So they sent me to, to test with Andy, um, and then we discovered that I was anemic. We started kind of building my iron stores back up again. Uh, and he sent me off to, to the World uh, Cross Country Championships in Boston with a little folder from my testing done, like just before I got on the plane, pretty much a week before. So on the plane out there, I was reading through the numbers, the best I'd ever tested. Uh, and his kind of predictions, you can really, you can go out there and you can meddle there. And, and that's key, I think, being told that, yes, you know you're in the best shape that you're in, but also the science shows that you're in the best shape that you're in, means that these guys step up to the line that little bit more confident that they, they're already supremely confident, but to know that, yeah, the numbers back it up, sends you there with that little bit of a boost and that little bit of, of extra energy to know, yes, I can run that. And as I see those numbers clicking by on the car in front of me and I'm on pace for this, I know that things are, are gonna work out today. I'm feeling good and a lot of this first stage would have been about that for when you start a marathon what you really want to do is run that first mile and know okay things are clicking things feel good i feel like I, i'm on today because if, if you're feeling rough in that first mile it's it's a long way out there for for the marathon so to know that things are feeling good to know that the science is there and your legs are, are really with you that's what these guys want to be feeling as you see a shot of the three elite of the elite Elliot Kipchoge from Kenya in the orange. We talked at the beginning uh, in our pre-show about his mindset. For him, this is a meditation, as we'll see him describe right now. Marathon is life. And life is where you progress. With good training, I don't see why I can't run a lot of This is the chance. Very nice, Elliot. No human is limited. That's my message. It's not about the legs, it's about the heart and mind. With a strong heart and good mind, you can do it. He's sort of like a chess grandmaster or some kind of Zen guy, you know. He's very chill and he goes out and he gets the job done. If you don't rule your mind, it can rule you. In this journey, I want to be the first one to cross the line and run under two hours. There's only one winner. That's obvious. 
that mindset fully on display, that, that real core belief and determination uh, that has gotten him to the place where, as we mentioned, at the, at the top seven of the eight marathons that he's run in, he's won. And the other one, he finished second, and the guy who beat him set a world record, so nothing to be ashamed of. I, I think that this, it comes from, from the culture of Kenya. You know, such a tradition of great runners over the years. When he was growing up in Kapsasiwa, Kenya, he would sometimes watch as Patrick Sang, who's now his coach, would run by. He was eight years old when Sang won the silver medal in the steeplechase at the Barcelona Olympics. When he started running motivated by Sang, Sang gave him, a, gave him shoes, gave him equipment, gave him workouts. And all these years later, they're still working together. And, you know, he's learned from the generations of Kenyan runners who have broken all sorts of barriers over the years. And it's just internalized to him. Yeah, it is definitely a, a culture. I got to spend some time last year in Eton in Kenya at some of the camps. And uh, I, was, I was blown away by that just collective. Uh, they, they all seem to possess uh, that real, real belief that they can be the best in the world, despite coming from a very small place just above the, the Rift Valley uh, in Kenya. As we see our, our, our first uh, five-kilometer split, the significance of that. Well, so they went through the, the first five kilometers in 1414. In I think they were aiming for 1410. For and the significance of that is that in the last, what, 400 meters since they went through that split, the pace has picked back up again. And they've actually jumped up on the projected time from, from two hours and eight to 159.56. And as much as we can say, yeah, look how calm and focused Elliot Kipchoge is in there, you can absolutely bet he's the one who went up guys up um, because he wants to hit those splits and he's although he looks really calm and really focused like he's not thinking of anything everything will be going over in his mind because that's that's the way he runs the way he analyzes all the information that comes to him in the race and, and processes that the intention for it from training was uh, to for this team to stay as as close together as possible uh, how long do you think that they'll be able to last in in this grouping well, that's what's so fascinating. We're going to find that out. They're going to just basically, for the first time, try and run on a pace for as long as possible. So it's a little bit changed from trying to get to, to the end as fast as possible. They're trying to stick to that pace for as long as possible, and we'll see how far they can do it. When you see a nice shot, uh, that arrow group of pacers, Kevin Hart, our sideline reporter, has been, is embedded there with the pacers. Kevin. It's intense out here, guys. <laughs> And let me. Where we, we have some audio difficulties with Kevin. We'll get his, uh, his, his mic fixed and then get some perspective from him there. Um, the Pacers have a, a specific situation there. They have trainers, they're getting nutrition, they have physio uh, for that 27 minutes or so during the break uh, so that they can, can, can be able to get right back into the mix uh, and not, not lose. Um, one key thing to just point out as well, as they're running along, so that red line is different to the traditional blue line that we see in the marathon. So traditionally, the blue line signifies the shortest line that you should run on the course. That red line actually indicates the inside line, so they need to run in, outside of that to be running exactly the, the measured distance in this course is fully certified. It's all been fully measured out by one of the best guys, David Kurtz, in the business who makes sure that they hit it exactly there. So he has said, don't worry if some of the paces step inside of that line or step on that line. Then we don't really mind if they don't run the exact distance. It doesn't matter. They're only running 5K each time. Um, but the guys behind it, you won't see them step near that line. Um, but they will run as close to it as possible to be absolutely running the shortest line to hug it and take advantage of it as much as possible. When you look at the, at the, at the different styles uh, in, in the manner in which Elia Delisa and Zersine run, they, 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 they look different, but it works for them. What are some of the key things? Well, one of the interesting things in the testing that was done was they all were incredibly efficient. Now, you look at their styles, they're all different, but efficiency has to do with the individual athlete and their physiological makeup and their biomechanics and Zersene Tedese is known to be incredibly efficient. Indeed he sits on the the half marathon world record can he double it up with that type of pace here today? Oh. 
ማራቶን ቀን ላይ ኮነን ስለም ሰዓት ነገር አጠርጋሎት ጥዋራ ደረሃና ግድን እንዴ በደሃም ሆነ ዘርዝነ ኢዝ ዘ ሮኪ ባልቦዋ ኦፍ ዚስ ግሩፕ አይ ሉክ አት ሂም ኤዝ ዚስ ጋይ ሁ ዊዝ ዘ ሊስት አማውንት ቶታል ኦፍ ሰፖርት ፕሮባብሊ ቡት ሂዝ ጌቲንግ ኢት ዳን ኤንድ ዌን አይ ሉክ አት ሂዝ ትሬዲንግ አይ ሚን ዳት ጋይ ኢዝ ፋስት he's an incredible half marathon athlete as, as we've seen he's actually one of the most accomplished distance runners of all time and i don't think he's got the credit that he deserves for that what is abizney saatat na yashas ndasi but zerzney what i've seen from him is speed he is so fast this guy is an absolute machine the rocky balboa of this group that is strong and i think it's significant you see him taking fluids here this was the thing as paula said earlier that has held him back in the marathons that he's tried your hydration strategy is not so important in the half marathon where he's a four-time world champion and the world record holder but to go the marathon distance you've got to take both fluids and energy while you're running each of these guys has a different fluid uh, that is tailored to the kind of sweating that they do all of which was studied and the kind of energy that they need at different points in the race specific carbohydrates specific sugars even that are particular to to each runner specific salts as well things that they know their their stomach can tolerate that's really important in the marathon that you can take on on fluid and you're not taking on here it's it's ideal because they're not taking on too much at one time when you you're usually racing a marathon you take on fluids every 5 kilometers you need to get a little bit more in you but, but when they're getting it as often as they want and certainly every lap so every 2.4 kilometers they can take on smaller amounts that can be then absorbed better and more efficiently into their body and, and that's the key point i think when we talk about zerzne and how efficient he is but how he really hasn't performed in line with his ability so far over the marathon distance and i think that's key it's down to to the fueling he just hasn't been able to optimize that strategy in the human body with the glycogen reserves we can put in place before the race can only get to around about 20 miles in a marathon um and then after that you have to have taken on fuel during the race and that's what he's really really worked hard on perfecting so that he's getting optimal fuel into his body to be able to maintain that pace throughout the race because at that 20 mile mark if you don't have the fuel what happens in your body you hit the wall with a big bang and that's what the marathon's <laughs> about and it's painful <laughs> Uh, as completely as a civilian who has run one marathon i ran new york in 2009 i i hit that wall and it was the worst day of my life i was mm-hmm. li- literally looking to the heavens and asking it to die uh, yeah. i didn't uh, and and i finished and I, i was really i was humbled it was one of the most humbling experiences uh of my life and i couldn't imagine what it's like at at this level yeah i think that's the, the key thing about the marathon is that it is humbling it it's very much a distance that Yeah you can conquer but you always need to respect it. Kevin, the Pacers are approaching you sir. What is your perspective down there? Well, first of all, amazing transition uh after talking about the humbling wall of death. Uh I am out here right now in a land where I probably shouldn't be. I'm here with the Pacers. It's intense. Okay? When I say intense, I mean intense. These guys aren't talking, they aren't breathing, they aren't high-fiving. There's no celebration. It is all business because they have a job to do. Uh with that being said, I'm gonna be honest, I was kicked out of the tent. <laughs> I was kicked out. I I was there. I tried to get some conversations and a group of guys told me I didn't belong here. Uh one of the most awkward situations of my life. I said I'm famous. Uh nobody cared. This this isn't the place for fame. It's the place for history to be made. So I politely walked outside the gate. Technically, I'm not even on the track right now. This is this is uncomfortable for me. I've never been treated like this, but it's okay. It's okay because I'm here to witness history and I have nothing but respect and admiration for all of these Pacers man because they're coming in there assisting on a big day guys this is a big day and I'm 
Thank you, Kevin. I think his, his mic cut out there I, at the end. It didn't cut out, guys. I'm asked to move again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to get out of here. I got to move. I think they think that you think this is breaking two electric boogaloo, but this, that's not what it is. This, this, is, this is breaking two, trying to break the two-hour barrier of the marathon. You like that one. I know I you did. did, Kevin. That's a good play on words, Sal. Good job. <laughs> And we saw that transition, the, the formation. I mean, these, the, they, you can tell that they, the, the Pacers have, have, have obviously rehearsed and trained so hard. What kind of communication uh, are, are they having uh, when they're in this group, if any? I, I think the biggest thing is that they, they have been really drilled in it, but also to accept that the Pacers coming in, they will be really nervous about getting this right. This is a really big deal. It's not just like pacing in a regular marathon. This is everything is keyed in to breaking through this barrier. So they need to get it right and they need to get it perfectly right. And and so far, they're, they're doing a great job. They're really hitting it bang on. They're a little bit ahead even of schedule. They're projected at the moment around about the, the one hour 59, 33. So if they can keep it on that, not get too carried away, I think we're going to see that's the, that's the key point here is the fact that these guys are being held to that. So we're not going to see a situation um, like, for example, a couple of weeks ago in the London Marathon when Mary Katani went out really too fast in the first 5K and could maybe have finished faster had she not gone out so fast in the beginning. They won't do that. As we see a shot in white of La Sisa de Sisa from Ethiopia, won the Boston Marathon two times. He would like... To be the man, as all three would, he would like to be the one to cross that finish line first. Lisa, he's a younger guy. He has no doubt he can go in against a couple of good guys in the marathon and shake it up. Oh, he really impressed us. His attitude seemed right, just pleased the whole package. What's the name of what do? He gets us on a one up, he gets a jiru, he gets a jiru. Running is my life. You know, he talks about running as his life. The, the typical story that we often hear about African athletes, he had a 50 to 60 minute walk to school when he was a kid. And uh, the story goes that he uh, didn't think that was far enough, and he would sometimes hand his books to some of his schoolmates, and he would run a longer distance home. So training from a very young age. I think it's also significant that he's wearing a white jersey. It's his, it's his favorite color, but he's also, he considers himself a man of peace after he won that 2013 Boston Marathon, where, of course, there was the great tragedy um, of the terrorist act there. He gave his medal back to Boston and the city really embraced him and it, it, it was a kind of change of life experience for him to be part of that story and of course he came back in 2015 and won the race again. Incredible. At what point did he really start to make uh, an impact where people are able to say this young man is has the potential to be amongst this elite group in the road? Well, pretty much on his debut. Um, he came out and he, he debuted in Dubai in 2013 and he ran 204.45 there. Uh, and that still is his personal best to this day. Um, he hasn't, he's still come back and he, he's won Boston, which isn't always a race that, that's about times there. Yeah, if you get a following wind, it can be, but it, on the occasions he's run, it, it hasn't been ideal conditions there. So he definitely is capable of going faster than that 205.45, but to come out and hit it on your debut and then struggle to get close to that. Sometimes that can play games with the mind, but it hasn't done that with him. Like, he's still very young. We usually say what you hit peak in the marathon around about 29, 30, 32, um, and pretty much where Elliot is right now. So, so he still has a lot of margin to, to improve and to get even faster. 
you know, he's a little different from the other two. His first running really was on the roads. He, he ran some track and field at a very young age, but he immediately went to the roads, and as Paula said, went to the marathon at a very young age for the outstanding performance to start. So uh, the other two, Elliot Kipchoge, really burst on the scene in 2003 when he won the world championships in the 5,000 meters, beating two legendary athletes, Hisham El Garouj, who won that event, the 5,000 in the Olympics the next year, and Kenanisa Bikhaili, who's many consider one of the greatest distance runners of all time. And this 18-year-old, uh, more or less unknown junior athlete came out and beat both of them, and that announced the arrival of, of Kipchoge. So just a quick word on the pace there. We can see that they've gone through the, the 10 kilometer mark in 28-21. So they're actually up on the, on the schedule now. They've, they've flipped from a little bit behind at the first five kilometers to ahead of schedule now. And you can see the, the pace is there just in the next group, just slotting back in. And we're now back to, to the original group. So they had, what, 27 minutes or so of recovery. Uh, and we're back with the first three pacer groups slotting in and slotting in very well there. That's so cool. <laughs> That was, I mean, the manner in which they switched in and out, it was, it was, it's, it's perfect. It's like they're running as one unit. Well, there's a lot of thought that went into who would run when. And uh, Paula mentioned earlier the tall man in the middle there, number one on his chest is Chris Derrick. He's probably the tallest of all of the pacers. And uh, that's an advantage, of course, because he's, he's creating more draft for the runners behind. Of all the places in the world that we could be for this race. We are here at, at Monza, and there are probably a lot of folks at home watching a, 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 around the world asking why. What about this place uh, caused uh, the team at Nike to say, there, we have our, our best chance to make history there? Well, there's a variety of factors, and some of them Paula had mentioned earlier. Uh, it's inland, so you don't have a, a big breeze coming off uh, the coast. Uh, it's, it's only about 200 meters above sea level, so you, there's no issue uh, with oxygen. Uh, very little elevation change in, on the course itself. Uh, the temperature, as we said, is perfect, and as Paula mentioned, uh, the humidity is not a factor really in this race. So you take all of those factors, the surface that Paul talked about earlier, and of course I like the fact that it's got this history of speed, which you documented, the fastest Formula One time ever. Yeah. Uh, Juan Pablo Montoya, I think it was 2005 or so that he ran it. You know, that, that's a, a history and a meaning which I think adds a little something extra. Yeah, to, to think that right here uh, where there, these steps are happening, speeds of 220 miles an hour on a regular basis. Well, here's more on why we are here at Monza. I think breaking two is possible if we have the right circumstances. We'd spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would be the best course. Top in our book was make sure that the course is really flat. We really wanted to focus on low altitude. In addition to that, cool temperatures are very important for the athletes, as well as low wind that helps the athletes move through the air without having much resistance. What we're really trying to do is create an awesome environment that allows the athlete to be most successful as possible. And Monza is one really crucial entity to ultimately get them to be able to break the two hours. Paula, the elevation change uh, on this loop is only about 10 feet total up and down. How does that differ from, from most road tracks, uh, most, most marathon courses? Well, most marathon courses will be not run on um, a loop course um, or at championships we will run a loop course but it might be like three or four loops um, of around about 10 kilometers so here 2.4 17 and a bit laps of a 2.4 kilometer loop means that it's a very controlled environment and everything can be perfectly controlled in terms of the paces coming out in terms of the guys on the bikes next to them passing the, the drinks as we're seeing in the bottom corner there to to Lalisa um, and that can mean that everything is on site nothing can can be left to chance uh, but these guys I mean we talk about the the Formula One cars and they're perfectly calibrated machines 
the runners are calibrated machines as well. So to be able to, to run on an, it's not manicured, but it, it, it's one step short of that, um, it, it is very, very significant to them. There, there are no potholes that they might twist twist their ankle in. There's no ups and downs that they need to, to factor in. Pretty much the only variable they have to think about is if any sort of wind comes up. That's the only thing that's going to change out there. And one thing that helps is they're in a forest. They're surrounded by greenery. And I went for a run here yesterday. I put on uh, the concept <laughs> shoes and uh, didn't run anywhere near as fast and certainly not as far. But I, I, I felt the cooling breezes that they're feeling now, not even a cooling breeze. It's just cool because of the, of the forest that surrounds them, the greenery. Birds were chirping and probably on the back stretch where there aren't a lot of people, they can probably hear the birds chirping. And it's a great environment. All three of them train in beautiful environments for at least part of the year. And they should feel very much at home here. And that produces extra oxygen into the air as well. Um, so the fact that they have the trees, the fact that it even rained a tiny little bit when they were warming up. Heilig Ebreslassi always used to say that he would have the track watered and he liked it to rain a little bit before he would go out for a world record attempt because he felt that that produced a little bit more oxygen into the atmosphere and he could just run that tiny little bit better. It is so peaceful. I mean, you, there's, there's no loud clanging for the most part. We have a, a small intimate group of, of, of fans uh, that were brought in here specifically, but this is, it looks like a, like almost a training run, uh, obviously besides uh, the car uh, in front of them and, and the, the, the folks that are there helping them with nutrition and hydration, but it looks like they're out on a training. It does, and I wonder is that significant because a lot of times when you come to a big race the crowd is a big factor i know when when i ran in london um to have that huge crowd and the atmosphere behind you and contributing absolutely helps you to elevate it to another level and that's maybe the only thing that's actually missing today this is hugely significant to each of those runners um there's no question about that but the actual only point on the course where they have a huge crowd there is when they come th down through this uh, this area where we're sitting now and they'll come through the changeover zone and past the pit lane and uh, the rest of the time it, it's very quiet out there so that does help them to, to get into their rhythm but i wonder also does it mean there's a little bit missing why do you think that this group ended up being selected um this the uh, elite group of east africans in particular you know we mentioned at the top of the show the the history in ethiopia of the marathon dating back to 1960 of ab bakila who ran barefoot through the streets of rome to win that marathon kenya the tremendous tradition so in those two countries uh, as big as uh, global football is in the rest of the world, or maybe baseball and American football are in the United States, uh, running is equal to that in these, in these countries. And there's a, a lore, there's a history, there's a respect, there's an opportunity to earn a living and to change your circumstances uh, that is built into the history of, of running in those countries. Uh, in addition, of course, growing up at, at 7,000 feet or 2,500 meters altitude also is helpful. And you see runners from around the world who will travel to Kenya, travel to Ethiopia to train to take advantage of that. So uh, they, they, they have a variety of different advantages that led to them to be uh, the chosen athletes who uh, the scientists felt had the best chance to break this barrier. Yeah, I saw that when I was in Eton, Kenya last year. There were mid-distance runners and long-distance runners from all over the world. But there was something about what you're talking about, meeting these kids who come from uh, mostly farmer families and who make that choice to, to say, if, if I do this and I take advantage of my surroundings with the mindset that I have in my, in my culture, I can take this to the next level and, and having those examples. Uh, there were 60 athletes at the beginning to get to this three. We'll learn more about the process of how we got Eliud Lelisa and Zersene. With the athlete selection process, we started with scanning about 60 athletes where we could look at their past performances and start to whittle on down from there. Yes. From those 60, we then identified about 18 athletes that we would then bring in the laboratory 
say, let's put you through the full test and see what you're really made of. Nice job, Steven. We tested a number of different things. One of those was what the athlete's VO2 max is. So you can think of that as how big their engine is. Well done, perfect. Another thing that we looked at was how uh, economical they are to run. You can think of this as your gas mileage. It's how much energy are you expending to run at a certain speed. That's a lot of stuff. Out of those 18 or so, we came to these three being close to or at a two-hour race. Nice, Elliot. Great work. Elliot Kipchoge, he's from Kenya. He's a world-class marathoner. He is 100% committed. He's 100% confident in his ability to do this. Well, Lisa De Sisa is from Ethiopia. Perfect. Just settle into that rhythm. And he's most notable for his Boston Marathon wins. Very good, very good. 20 seconds. Keep looking forward. Just keep running, man. Keep running. He just kept going and going and going. He definitely has the potential to do this. Zersene Tedese, uh, I really like Zersene. He's very fast. Nice job, Z. What on, Z? He has the world record in the half marathon. His physiology is exceptional. They've all got different strengths and weaknesses, but I'm excited about all of them. They've got different characters and personalities, as you've seen, and it's going to be fascinating to see how the story unfolds. We just saw a glimpse there, but it, it was very interesting to, to, to see the different levels that they were putting these athletes through, even with uh, the, the, the treadmill that was specific, and they'd make sure they had the, the right sort of weather conditions when they were even running on the treadmills. Yeah, every element of the, of the preparation for this ha has been looked at and has been controlled and has been perfected a, as much as they possibly can. And I think talking to, to Andy yesterday, he was saying the biggest thing was that all three of these guys really bought into that because you have to believe that this isn't going to hinder your training, that, that being strapped up to these machines is, is only going to bring something to the table and bring something to how well they can go out and perform. And absolutely every one of these three bought into that, wanted to take on board as much of the science as they could and wanted to kind of look at all those little areas where that key difference can be made, even if it's a fraction of a percent. Well, it's really interesting that Elliot, prior to the Breaking 2 project, had never run on a treadmill. He'd never had his VO2 max tested. He'd never had his lactate threshold tested. He'd never been evaluated for his running economy. In fact, he'd only rarely worn a, worn a heart rate monitor. So to your point, this required a massive change in, in just how he conducted his business of running, and yet he embraced it because he saw the possibility to take himself to a new level. And when we talk about the fact that we're, we're trying to, to shave off just under three minutes here to, to, to break this barrier, uh, it, it, it really puts it in perspective. And we see that this pace, put in the context what, what it's like at, at this pace, staying this driven. Well, I think we can't by any means underestimate the scale of what they're trying to do here because it's a phenomenal jump. You can look at it and you can think the world record sits at, at 2 two fifty seven, but to go under the two from there, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's that kind of six seconds a mile or whatever it is that they have to pick it up. But that's a lot to be able to do that. And they're really pushing everything and they need to maximize every little area. Around 13 miles an hour as we see them making their way through this right hand turn. We will check in with Kevin Hart, who is with someone far faster than him. I am with the man, the myth, the legend. I'm talking about Mr. Carl Lewis himself. Uh, Carl, this is amazing what we're witnessing here today. Um, yesterday, I said, you know what, I want to experience. I want to see how fast these guys are actually going. So I decided to get out there with the Pacers because that's the type of person I am. I got to witness it myself. So I got out there. I got, you know what, I'm not going to talk to you about it. I want you to see it first. We got a clip of what I did yesterday. Can we, can we show the clip to Carl, please, guys? Let's show Carl the clip. This is me with My the pacers. My new nickname is going to be Cheetah Feet. <laughs> I look amazing. Wait a minute. Hold on. Start to struggle a little bit, Carl. Yeah. yeah. Woo! Y'all keep going. I don't even think they know that I stopped running. That's how fast those guys are going. Those guys are. They're like gazelles. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I. 
I have asthma. That's what made me slow up. I don't have my inhaler on me. You got to take your hat off to the runners. Y'all go ahead! I mean, four minutes and 34 seconds a mile. That's booking. Those guys are like the speed of light. I got to go find my inhaler. Hey! I have my inhaler! They have their inhaler. Should I be walking on the track? Yeah, I mean, as you... As you see, Carl, I'm an asthmatic. You, well, you saw that. So you, how, how much farther could you think you could have gone? Oh, I could, I could do the whole 20, 26 if I wanted to, but I had my wedding ring on. That okay. slows me up. <laughs> yeah, what did you think about my form, though, Carl? I thought the form was good, you know, until you started to slow down. You know, but it's, it's all you were clear when you decide, okay, let me let these guys go. Because, you know, I, I know you, Kevin. I watched you run yesterday, and, and I know you have to let other people win some sometimes. See, that's what makes you a legend, Carl. You understand how to feed the ego. <laughs> Uh, we're nothing without the ego. Uh, anything that you have to say, man? I mean, listen, the guy that's done everything that you've done, of course, not only in the world of running, but just in your career, to see what we're seeing today, like, do you, are there any thoughts? Like, what, what, is your, what are your concerns? What do you think overall about this whole concept of these guys trying to break this record? Oh, man, I, I think it's amazing. You know, um, I, when I look at what they're doing, first of all, you start, like, two years ago, and you start thinking about, I'm going to do something in two years from now. That's the biggest issue. I can't be sick in two years from now or feel bad or anything like that. And when you finally get to this moment, you've got one shot right tonight to do it. So um, when they started off, I know it was, it was exciting for them, but also trying to, trying to keep your pace down. Did I sleep well last night? Was I too excited? Um, am I going out too fast? Gosh, my stomach's starting to cramp, but is that going to be too bad? There's so many things you're thinking about. And in our races, it was over in 10, 15 seconds, but they've got to do that time after time. Is this step right? Because that one second could be over 500 steps and then all of a sudden I'm 500 steps behind. So there's a lot for them to think about and stay focused for, the, for those two hours. I, can, I can't imagine how marathoners do it. Yeah, I mean, the only reason why I couldn't do it, Carl, I'm lactose intolerant. So, you know, my biggest thing is my, my stomach, my digestive system. So I don't know, you know, what it's going to be like. My thing is, uh, am I going to have an accident? <laughs> You know, that's the thing that's on my mind the most. But we don't need to get into me and my system. It's not about us. It's about these guys out here today. We're going to continue to watch and hopefully witness history. We're going back to you guys. I'm going to talk to Carl because I want to talk to him about breaking the speed of light because that's what I'm focused on. It's a two-year plan. Back to you guys. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you, Kevin. Uh, in, in the midst of that hilarity, uh, Carl Lewis, who was in our, our, our research meeting yesterday, which I, I just had to like put that into perspective. Uh, but he said something very interesting about that two years and, and looking forward and what you need to have on that day, as you see Lalisa here. I thought Carl said something really smart. He said that a lot more can happen in two hours than can happen in 10 seconds. Here's L Lalisa and his training on this road. Take Verdis. Verdis fly. Sunset is not fly. But he created aeroplane. Now, breaking two. We're saying, you know, not only are we going to bring you in here, Lelisa, you're going to break a world record. I mean, and you're going to go under two hours. This is one of the best tests we've had. This is fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll need it. Uh, that's a crazy idea. Generation in Amma, generation in Harawanti. Yero kama san siri garan teknolojin wana dada agaru ugate enu timundis. Adem si san siri teknoloji kuno mo wanton ni namo je chajuro na ilalu. Lulisa is being really receptive and very willing to try any suggestions that we lay out. He wants everything that we possibly give him and more. Ule sa dweta chi indet no chalalu waya. Maybe this is not possible. Supported by science and the technology, yeah? maybe possible. It says a lot when an athlete can say, by myself, maybe, not, not, not really. But did that buy-in that you talked about, Paula, of, with Lisa's own words about the, the science and technology to say, hey, uh, after this experience, yeah, possible. 
Yeah, and it, it, it's that buy-in, that faith in the team. And I had to smile a little bit there on the clip when, when Andy's there. Come on, Elisa, this is the best yet. He says that every time. <laughs> um, but what he's basically doing is, is building up the confidence. And that's key to be told by the people who know, by the scientists, you know what, you're in amazing shape. You can absolutely go out there and do this. And there's no scientific reason why you can't. It's really up to you is the best feeling to get coming into it. And these guys will feed off that confidence that they get from the team around them and from the way that they feel in training to really come in here and push their minds because it is as much about the mind as it is about the body out there today and being able to stay focused right in the moment and on one foot in front of the other on that pace and just keep focused right here. You know, of the three runners, he's the one that had a little bit of difficulty earlier in the year with a small injury. So, you know, the team aspect is important to him. And he said that he sees uh, Kipchoge and Tedese as, as friends. You know, not, it's not, he calls them brothers and friends. And that, you know, he really bought into not only the team aspect of the scientists and his own training partners, but his uh, fellow comrades there. Well, you, you think about a sport like this that is so individual and these three buying into the idea that we're going to essentially be a team for a couple of years. And trying to stay with the team here as well. I mean, I think we do have to point out that there is a tiny bit of daylight opening up there. And of, of the three, Lalisa, for me, is, is the one who's, who's struggling first at this point. It may be that he'll go through a bad patch and, and he'll be able to get back on it. That happens in the marathon. Every athlete coming to the start line of a marathon knows and accepts there are going to be rough patches. There are going to be rough patches within this race where I really need to go to my special place, somewhere within me where I can kind of regroup, focus, get things back together and come through it and have faith that, that you will come through it because so many times in training you hit the rough patch and you come through it and you know you can come through it and come out the other side. But it's keeping that focus through the difficult spots that he's going through right now. How do you avoid finding yourself in a, in a, in a panic when you get to that rough patch? that rough spot it's 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 experience i guess and, and it's it's faith like i say that you, you can get through it but it's very hard i mean what's going through his mind right now is oh my god i can't stay on this i can't stay with that pace and that is the goal that i've been working to let's face it for a couple of years coming into this that's where i need to be and i'm falling back and that panic is really dangerous because it can paralyze paralyze your breathing paralyze your muscles uh, and he's really really struggling and, you know, you mentioned that you have bad patches and you come back from them. But knowing a lot of times what runners are able to do in marathons is come back because the pace slows down and lets them back in the race. We see this on the track sometimes. The pace is not going to slow down, and he knows it. It's relentless. It's going to continue. And that's going to make it very difficult for him to get back. So at this point, he not only has to run that pace, he has to run faster than they're running to get back into it. They will give him pacers. Uh, mm -hmm. at some point to try to help him but it's going to be very very difficult yeah so they talked about that pacer strategy they have the 32 paces uh, and i think they have 18 guys that that are rotating as per the plan um, and then behind that they have another five or six seven maybe that may jump in now with lalisa that is dropped off but if another one of, uh, of these two drops off they will move up and they will abandon the back guy because they don't have enough paces to, to keep covering that. The other floaters, if you like, the other six, seven paces are reserves in case there's any problem with any of the front 18. Well, we talked about at the outset how long they would be able to stay together uh, at this pace. As we see a shot of Eliud and Zersene. Zersene checking his watch there, just making sure that the big clock in front of him, maybe he hasn't looked up and clocked that. And then that often happens, I think. A lot of times in, in big races, you're just focusing on yourself uh, and you're not aware of what's around you. Well, here's some perspective on Zersene Tedese and his training. Zerzne was head and shoulders above everybody we tested, and we didn't even have to look at the numbers. We basically saw him on the treadmill, and immediately he shines like a different character in the way he runs. 
There's no question that he has the physiology. His running economy is exceptional. He do, you look at his numbers on the treadmill and on the track, you know, he's, you could argue, is our best prospect. To 10, to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Excellent. Perfect. He's barely making any lactate. He's barely breathing hard. And it's, and it's world record marathon pace. As <laughs> a monster. His numbers are nothing short of extraordinary. Um, he holds the half marathon world record. Not surprising at all. What is surprising is that he was unable to make a great leap to the marathon. I don't think that he really knows how much to drink, how often to drink. I think his deficiency is something that we can overcome. He has at the NMI to go road train to Magagwa. They can't In my opinion, he's the dark horse. And if I were with Lisa or Elliot, I would be very concerned if I come into the last mile with Zuzne Tedesse. You know, one of the major differences for him is that he trains by himself for half the year in Madrid, away from his family, uh, no, tr no particular training partners. He's kind of on an island, and he does his hardest workouts by himself, which is really different. I mean, when you think about the large group that... Uh, um, Elliot has in, in Kenya. Uh, he's, he's sort of quiet and mysterious, which makes this all very interesting. But, you know, uh, Mo Farah, uh, four time gold medalist in the Olympic Games, says that this is the guy he fears the most. Wow. Yeah, I think his potential is. It's, it's really there and it, it's really tangible and to be able to to have this opportunity now to get his fueling strategy right and to to find out because it's without question he is the best half marathoner probably that there's ever been on this planet but certainly that we have right now um, and it's that unique question of yeah as much as the science can say and as much as they can say you're built for the marathon it's a unique beast and sometimes you can get it right, and sometimes you just can never quite make that step up. And it, it's, it's that fascination, I think, for me, that is so interesting. With, with Zerzne, can, with the fueling, can he really hit it and hit his potential at the marathon? Or is it just always going to be that, that distance that doesn't quite fit? And this blistering pace and being able to sustain that for not just a half marathon, uh, but for this in, entire marathon, as we take a look at the Pacers at the front. So here we get a look at exactly how that changeover takes place. There's 150 meters where in the first 50 meters, uh, the group exits that's in the lead. Uh, other runners move up. And then in the second 100 meters, the three new runners come in I had a little worry about this when I first heard about it because I wondered that's a tough job to come into the race. One, at the right pace, and two, not to disrupt the runners behind them. But so far, it's gone very smoothly. And it's not a lot of space. No, it's, it's a short area. And I was, I was talking to Bernard Lagat. I'm not sure if this is him coming in now. I haven't spotted him yet come in. But he said that he was really talking to, to Kipchoge about this and saying, like, you have to not, because the instinct is when the first guys peel off and the next row moves up your instinct is to follow them and move up but what they have to do and he said give us space man give us space to get in there because you need to leave us two three meters at least to be able to to slot in as that second row of paces and then to be able to get back on pace and that's what they're doing really really well because the actual races here today the three guys so now the two of them have not practiced this with the paces the paces have been drilled over and over again but they didn't want to they said no just tell us what's going to happen so we're absolutely clear with what's going to happen but we don't want to actually practice it running around. Why do you think that was that the that the racers chose to say we'll leave it for game day? I think it's prep. I think it's the fact that actually the day before and two days before the marathon when the drill the paces have been drilling it so much, you don't really want to be running too much at race pace. You want to be resting as much as possible and saving every bit of energy for race day. As we are just under the one hour mark and at the 20, 20 kilometer split. So yeah, 20 kilometers passed through there in 56, 49. Uh, and the pace has slipped back a little bit from that 159.30 they were on earlier, but still predicted to go through on pace for breaking through that two hour barrier. 
And it looks to me, Paula, that uh, Zersene has had a couple of hard moments uh, in his last lap. Uh, he drifted back one time, and you could say, well, maybe it was because they were going to change the pacers and he wanted to give them the room that you talked about. Uh, then he drifted back again, and now he just, he just seems to be having trouble holding on. Obviously, he's not getting the benefit of the pacers at this point. No, he's not. I think that's the situation we talked about when now he will get that draft of the second group of pacers come in to, to help him. But that, that's significant daylight there, and that's not intentional. So he may be able to pick up and come back from that, but it, it's very dangerous for him at, at this point in the race to, to be losing contact like that. As we saw Eliud uh, looking f firmly in that group of the lead pacers. And that's what you talked about, this second group here. Yeah, so this is now, this is, that was the second group, a quick shot of them um, with Lalesa running. But some of those will now peel off and they may split three and three um, and run a little bit with each of them uh, as long as they both keep going. But what they had talked about yesterday was the fact that they would focus fully on, on the second guy at this point. We see Kipchoge. He is looking strong again of the eight marathons that he has run. He has won seven. And we'll have a look at his training process over the course of this last couple of years. Sports needs teamwork. If you are only one, then you can do nothing. But if you are more than one, then you can do great things. There was this sort of serenity when the Kenyans were training in particular. Kipchoge's got this quietly dominant personality. He just exudes class. This was a pure profession. I'm treating it with total respect. 30.2. I think Elliot is a well-oiled machine. He's sharp. He knows exactly what he's doing. Very intelligent. He thinks a lot about the mind as well as the body, sort of preparing his mind to be able to run this fast. is thinking. We'll do three minutes here, okay? Very nice, Elliot. You need to focus fully and think positively. Right now, when we talk to Elliot, he says, I will break two hours. Absolutely comes out with it and says it, I will break it. He's very confident. He has real belief in his own ability. He was leading them pretty much the whole way. Good run, Elliot. Well done. Passion is a choice. You need to choose to be great. It's not a chance. It's a choice. I love his philosophic approach uh, to his sport. And the, I mentioned earlier the sort of monastic lifestyle that he has at his training camp where he shares a 10 by 10 room with another runner. He pulls up water by hand from a well. He washes his clothes in a bucket every day after he after he runs. He's not taking, you know, he's not pretentious in any way. This is a man who's you know, a multimillionaire based on his running, uh, but he keeps true to what has gotten him there. And he records every workout over the last 14 years. Wow. I like that last, that last quote of his that uh, he says it's, it's a choice. And in the manner of how he lives, those are all choices, especially when the, the sport that you love has given you the opportunity to afford uh, a lifestyle that goes away in the manner in which you grow up with. And, and last year when I, when, I, when I was in Eton, that was something that struck me about a lot of the runners. They lived, even the, the, the most successful for the most part, lived in a very humble lifestyle to sort of stay in, in that focus. Yeah, and it's it's what works for them as well. It's the way that they've they've grown up, and, and the way that they know preparing enables them to, to go out and succeed in this. And it, it's a choice, but I think it's also a privilege for them um, to be able to to get this opportunity to to put everything into being able to accomplish uh, the best that they can do and find out whether they can break through these barriers. I think for all of us that have been lucky enough to, to take part in athletics and to, to take part in the sport of running, it's a privilege to be able to get out there and do something that you love doing every day. And it is a passion for Elliot as well. He gets a lot of a lot back from running as much as he gives to the sport of it. But he has a huge, huge talent. And I think that's the thing that really struck me watching him win the London Marathon in 2016. Then he absolutely has the potential to take down that world record officially and he's almost sacrificed this to just see really what he's capable of with the whole support that he can put in today and so he's fully committed 
to this because he really believes that he can be the first man to break through that barrier. You see he is the lone of the three. So it almost looks like he's like he's running with a, a security detail at 13 miles an hour. And to, to see the manner in which the Sisa and Tedese have, have, have dropped off, it really it, it really puts in the context. We're, these are these are the best runners in the world, and this pace has has gotten the best of, of both of them, and they've been training specifically for this moment for two years. And that just underlines, I think, the enormity uh, of the feat that they're trying to achieve here. Um, um, we probably can't stress enough of that. If you set a treadmill at the pace that they're running at now, and you try to, to maintain it, most of us could not do that for, for more than kind of 20, 30 seconds, if that. Some of the, the paces out here are at world-class level, uh, and they have had to train and really prepare. Bernard Legat was really nervous about, am I going to be able to hit the pace, and am I going to be able to, to do it right out here today? So to be able to maintain it over the marathon, I mean, we're, we're talking about the fact that Zezane and, and Lalisa have dropped off this, but they've still gone through halfway in a pace that would win most major half marathons going on. Yeah, and I think you've, you've said this a couple of times, and it, and it can't be said enough, frankly, which is to do what they're setting out to achieve will take a special day. And Joan Benoit Samuelson said it, that it'll have to be a rare day for one of these athletes where everything clicks. At this point, the only one that seems to have that chance is Elliot Kipchoge. Yeah, discussing it with Joan last night as well, she, al she also said that there's one quote about this, um, and that it, it's possible, but it's not probable. Um, so they have to go and really look for that and really search for, for that, that possibility because it, it is about everything just coming together on the day. And these guys are used to that. That happens every time you step to a start line. But this time, more than, more than any time before in, in their careers, it really has to be perfect today. There is Bernard now in the second pack uh, in the center there and, and slotted in right behind him, focused just on his heels. Elliot is just, he basically hasn't moved from that position in that formation. Even when the, the, the three athletes were all together, he was very much the, the alpha male, if you like. He was the guy who, who's controlling it. It's the way he trains too. It's the way he's used to almost without words dominating the group and getting them to, to run where he wants them to do and, and just focusing. You can see his head is barely moving and he's just absolutely in that place inside him, focused on what he's aiming to do today. As you see in that shot over the shoulder of uh, Kipchoge, the scientists on the bike communicating, looking at stopwatches, uh, the science is really the key uh, to this possibility at breaking two.
different than anything that I've ever felt before. Even you could run fast in those. Yeah. <laughs> when, what the athlete said uh, that Paula was referencing is that they wanted the right weight, not the light weight. And yeah. that, was, that was the real insight that led to this footwear being developed. And the Zoomax foam that's there returns 80 to 90% of, of the energy. Well, when we say that every piece has been designed specifically for them, you will see what detail we mean in this piece. The notion of us doing what we're doing is a completely audacious idea and that was so inspiring for our design team from the get-go, not only functionally but aesthetically. You want zero distractions for the athlete. You want the athletes to be able to run and not think about their footwear. You don't want their feet to hurt, you don't want laces to come untied, and the number one thing is comfort and fit. We want it to be perfect for you, so we're going to tune every piece of product that we have, whether it's the shoe or the apparel or the sock, to make sure it's right for you. These shoes are one-to-one -one for the athlete, so it's completely individualistic. This has grown through conversations with those three athletes. Leveraging digital design and data is a big, big part of our design process. We'll be scanning your foot so then we can adjust the upper here and then be able to send you or bring to you shoes that actually fit better. They'd never really experienced that level of customization before. Race. Beyond the tuning on a pixel level, we can control where they have comfort, where, where they need containment, where they need breathability. Perfect garments for you, for your measurements. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One of the areas that we personalized the product for the athletes was for them to be able to print on the shoes. Zerisene asked for his wife's name to be on the shoe. Lalisa wanted the names of his mom and dad on the shoe. And when we visited Elliot in January, what he wanted printed on the side of the shoe was beyond the limits. People put limits on themselves or other people put limits on them. And for him, it's about we should all think about pushing beyond those limits and not just take what's given. As we see, Elliot Kipchoge still in the hunt of being beyond the limit in this lead group. And when we talk about this, this track being here at Monza, and you, you think about a Formula One team or, or a race team, it's all about the details. And they're trying to, to get these lower coefficients to just get just some little thousandth of a second uh, less time uh, when they're engineering the vehicles. And to see that being applied uh, to, the, to, to an athlete in, in this level with the shoes and the clothing, uh, incredible. You know, no better expert than Kevin Hart said that the footwear looks like a spaceship for your feet. And it, it, it's totally true. And they, these guys have as much behind them as it's possible to have at this day today uh, in terms of the technology and everything like that. And absolutely, it's moved on hugely from where we were even 10, 20 years ago in, in marathoning and in road running. But let's not forget, this is about the human inside there as well. And as much, the shoes are not going to break this barrier on their own. It's all about the athlete trying to do it. It's all about Elliot Kipchoge and that mindset of, until I try, I don't know where my limit's going to lie. And unless I really go for it and I really stretch, I can't fail by finding that I can't do it. I just find that it's going to take me a little bit longer to get there. So if, if he didn't, by any means, fail today, he learns something still and he can still grow from that and come back again. But what he's absolutely saying is I'm just going to take it to the well today. I'm going to lay everything on the line that I have and see, am I good enough yet? Well, that choice that he, he, he made uh, to, for, for what he printed on the shoe to, to go beyond the limits. I liked what he said, you know, he, he calls as we heard the two hour barrier completely arbitrary he said it could have been 155 as far as he was concerned he would have trained for that if uh, someone had had aimed him as as preposterous as that sounds but you know he did take advantage of personalizing it, and he put his wife and children's names on the sock liner on the inside of the shoe so he's got the the message about beyond the limits outside and the family is all inside We get a really in incredible glimpse here of this transition.
he's really getting to be a pro at that dropping back and, and allowing the, the new paces to slip in. Well, there are some lucky, passionate runners uh, from around Europe that had the opportunity to, to be here today. Some of them camping out uh, here on the grounds. Kevin Hart, is in, a man of the people, is in with the people. That's right. I am a man of the people, so it's only right that I come down and embrace and engage with the people. I'm standing here with Corey and I'm with Gabs. They're from London. Uh, huge fans of running. Excited to be here. I want to get some words from the people. Corey, what does this event mean to you? Um, to me, oh, thank you. To me, this is absolutely ridiculous. As in, we watch marathons happen out on the road. We watch them happen on the television. But to be here, right here, watching history happen is incredible. To watch people run at this pace is ridiculous. As in, I couldn't even keep up something like this for a mile, let alone a kilometer. Yeah, well, you need to watch me run, Corey, because I'm, I'm a blur, okay? Uh, Gabs, talk to me right now, okay? From what I understand, you're an amazing athlete. You're from London as well. Uh, I know Corey is a coach, but I want to talk to you. What does this mean? How do you feel? Are you just as excited? I mean, yeah, this is like our, our Everest. It's insane just uh, yeah, to watch these guys out here trying. And the fact that he's still on pace, he's going for it, super exciting. We're here with all our friends, which is also really fun, camping out. But yeah, it's insane. It's really insane. You know, remind me to get you guys tickets to my next track and field event, because I, I think you guys will be blown away just at some of the events that I do. Uh, uh, it's the 10-yard dash. I don't even know if you guys have it in the UK, but I hold the record in uh, the 10-yard dash. Whatever, it's a long story short. This isn't about me, okay? It's about the event. It's about making history, and I'm glad that we can have people like yourselves here to be a part of it. This is really, really dope, and I think what's even cool is just how you see people embrace it. People that are about the sport that come and support, that's what it's about. It's not just about what you're doing. It's about the support that you get while doing it. History can't be made without support, and they're going it. They got it. I'm sending it back to you because we're going to go back to doing what we do best, and that's cheering. I'll see you later, guys. Thank you, Blur. We will not even re refer to you as Kevin Hart anymore. Thank Only you. Blur. And if you, if you follow Kevin Hart on, 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 on social media, one of the incredible things he, he, he's done in the last couple of years, actually motivating his fans to come out and go on runs with him wherever he's touring in the country. Uh, and it's crazy. He, he put something out on social media, and thousands of people show up, uh, and he's got people running. Very, very inspi inspiring. So while he does make jokes uh, about his running and blur, he, he really is about that life, as we'd say. But this man, Eliud Kipchoge, is about that life. Look at the focus, the determination in his face. But there's also, maybe it's just me, that, that there seems to be an ease despite what he's under. Yeah, I mean, he, he is the master at keeping as much of his body relaxed as possible. And that sounds like a bit of an oxymoron. How can you be relaxed when I need all my muscles to be firing at the right time? But all of his facial muscles, there's zero effort going on there, zero wastage of energy. He's very efficient in, in the parts of his body that he can really kind of turn off and focusing on the parts that need to be functioning. A quick update on the pace. They went through the 25 kilometers in, in one hour, 11.03, which is projected marginally now under that two-hour barrier. That is exciting as we're at this 122 mark. Now we've talked so much about these shoes. We will show them to you now more in detail. Uh, to see what it is that they are running on. The origin of the footwear goes back three to four years. Early on, we went down the path of pursuing the ultimate lightweight racing flat. That was the conventional thinking in marathon footwear. I'd like for you to try this on and see how it fits. We pivoted after speaking to the athlete and hearing that concrete really hurts. And if there was any way that we could cushion them from the ground, that would be a big win but not do it with a weight implication. And we started to create the product that you see today, which is a big shift from marathon shoes of the past. The shoe that you've been running in, do you like how soft it is? The foam is special because yeah. it's ultra lightweight and it's ultra resilient. So you get better cushioning, better protection from the ground, but still have the overall shoe be really light. And then we have this plate as well with a very unique geometry. It's a really a strong material, it's a carbon fiber and so it provides added propulsion. It's actually the system of this and the foam coming together that delivers the magic. In the process, we were exploring some aerodynamic insights, and what we found was that if you elongate the shoe, you can actually reduce drag. 
and that's what led to this elongated heel shape. I can say it's good, but I need comparison. So if you could try these on and just run around a little bit. So what we believe we've delivered here is the optimal weight to cushioning to responsiveness relationship. It was super special for me to be here in Monza and see Elliot cross the line in the marathon test in the shoe. It's emotional, it's amazing to see that, you know. We've been working tirelessly for the last three years on this and to see it come to life and be used by somebody of that caliber in an event that's this audacious, I mean, it's, it's a dream for a designer. There's only a small number of these uh, Zoom Elites available, but you can get a chance uh, to get them yourself. So you can log a 5K run in the Nike Plus Run Club app uh, to be entered. Uh, make sure you go to nike.com slash just do it. Uh, more information is with the terms and conditions. And we are joined right now by Ed Caesar, author of Two Hours. You're also a contributing uh, writer for Wired. I've been following uh, a lot of your writings in the last couple of months. This must be something special to, to, to be actually here witnessing this attempt. It's crazy for me. I imagined how this might play out. And there's a guy that is 40 minutes away from doing the thing that I imagined. Uh, and it's such a privilege to be here. You did so much interesting work in going to Kenya and spending time uh, with the greatest uh, marathoners in the world. Uh, you gleaned some real information and gems about what makes them so special at this distance, their training, the kind of monastic living. What were some of your biggest takeaways? I mean, I think this particularly relates to Elliot, who's now, um, who's now, who's now running so fast and so well here. He has built his, he has built his career uh, over a period of 15 years, and he has uh, built it slowly by slowly, from the track to the marathon. Uh, they've really, they really build on solid foundations. There's nothing special. It's just hard work. Well, you mentioned coming from the track, and uh, one of the stats that really jumps out at me is that he's run a 350 mile in his career. In fact, his personal best in the mile is faster uh, than the personal best of Matthew Centrowitz, the American who won the 1500 meters at the Olympics in Rio. So that kind of speed is unprecedented for a marathon. Yeah, and you see it, you know, in the final stages of the London Marathon, in the final stages of, of big city races, he can really shift. I mean, what we saw in London when he was cruising down the mile uh, just before the finishing line was electrifying, uh, as anyone who loves any kind of sport to see an athlete like that. And really enjoying it as well, big smile on his face and moving so fast. I mean, it, it was a privilege to watch that looking casual in the most not casual of situations. I mean, look at him now. This guy is doing something that nobody has ever done before. Nobody's ever run at two hour pace for this long. And uh, there isn't any strain on his face. There's still a long way to go and a lot of things can happen in the last 35 minutes of a marathon as anyone who's run one knows. So uh, it's not a done deal, but uh, he looks good. We were talking about the footwear and you had an interesting comment about the wearing the footwork as you've worn the prototype in some of your training they, you said it. it makes you feel as if you're on wheels not legs i just it's you rock forward in a in a very unusual way i have actually run around here in the in the in the shoes and they are they propel you forward in a really unusual way um it's actually quite unsettling until you get used to it Obviously, these guys have had a long time to get used to it, and I think a lot of um, good runners, club runners, you know, hobby runners are going to get a lot out of them, um, but they take a while to get used to, I'm sure. Now we see at the 30K, he's just a, a second over the desired pace, still projected to run the two-hour marathon, which is incredible, as Ed says, that he's still holding this pace. and. There was a lot of chatter in the running world over the last several months about whether this was possible and people were giving different sorts of uh, percentage guesses. I think there's even a betting line in London on this. And, uh, you know, you were so deeply involved in this whole notion of two hours over the last several years writing yeah. your, your book. Uh, tell me about the, this moment now. You, you were putting in a little bit of perspective. Did you vision this as the way it would play out? I always thought it would take an event like this, specialized event, to do it. And, uh, you know, I thought of some things that you could try. The, the pacing strategy, I think, has been working really well here. They seem, to, they seem to have been able to move the teams in and out very seamlessly. Um, but 
the way that I thought about it was that you would maybe want to do it much colder than you're doing it today. And in fact, um, a lot of the athletes would say actually they feel uncomfortable at those temperatures. So it's a, there's a division there between what the science tells you and what the athletes are telling you. Um, but certainly it seems to be working at this point. I, I always thought it was an outside shot. It's a hard thing to do. It's a crazy thing to do. Um, and I still think there's a long way to go in this. You know, it's still an outside shot, but there's one guy with a big chance. I mean, he's just taking on some fluid there, and he doesn't look like he's broken stride or, or taken any pace off, really. He's still looking good. I mean, he may have slowed down slightly in the last 5K. Is that right? Just by a couple of seconds? One second. One second. Craig, how, how important is the hydration factor at this period of a race? Well, this is the critical moment. I mean, the, the, the last six miles of, of the race, um, in, in this case, you know, the last 24 minutes or so, 25 minutes, you know, the body, it can, it can only go so far uh, with the storage that it has of glycogen. Uh, the, f the fluids, they, there's, you know, some estimate that they'll lose two liters of fluid during the course of, of this two hours. So if you're not constantly replacing that fluid and adding energy, uh, you're not going to make it, as Paul was saying earlier. There was a, there was a uh, study done on Haile Gabriel Selassie at the, at the 2007 Berlin Marathon where he lost something like 10% of his body weight over the course of breaking the world record. I mean, that is astonishing. You know, the amount of the, these guys are sweating is just uh, crazy. I just, I think it's worth pointing out at, at, at this point that we are witnessing something special even if he doesn't do it. Nobody has ever done this. And Elliot Kipchoge has already shown that he belongs to a line of runners that starts with Spirit on Luis and goes through all the greats, you know, Clarence DeMar in Boston, um, you know, guys like Zatopek. This guy belongs with those, those great names. He is the, the premium marathon runner of this generation. And he deserves to be celebrated whatever happens on, you know, in the remainder of this race. I, I think he deserves to be celebrated because he's trying this. You know, in some ways, the easier decision might have been to go to London For sure. again, where I felt, and I'm sure you were there last year, I, I felt that he was surprised when he saw how close he was to the record. Had he yeah. known what pace he was on, uh, he, he would have been able to break the record, uh, uh, the world record in, in London as we uh, see him at, at 30K. Um, one of the amazing things of his races in London, particularly uh, his first victory, is he was running... Uh, paces about what he needs to run today in the 25th and 26th mile. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and he's, you know, we've talked about how hard these latter stages of this effort are. Uh, but the fact that he was able to run uh, under four minutes and 40 seconds per mile towards the end of his uh, London marathon races uh, is significant when we think about what he's got to do here. Well, that's, that tells you something, but it's different running those paces when you haven't run them in the first 24 miles. <laughs> to doing what he's doing now. I th is it possible that he's just slowing a tiny bit? That, may that maybe they're losing a couple of seconds here and there? I mean, it's definitely, they can get it back, but they're just slightly outside, slightly outside two hours. But it looks like they're pretty much keeping a rock solid pace. You know, talking about pace, there was a lot of discussion before about what the optimum way would be to run this right. race. Since the both world records, Paula, Paula Radcliffe's record on the women's side and the men's world record were set with negative splits where people ran faster in the second half of the race than the first half. And here the decision was to run an even pace. Now, um, you know, there was some controversy about that. There was some thought that maybe the physiology suggested that you should run uh, negative splits, but the psychology said you had to stay on this pace from the start. Yeah, I think, I mean, there, there are various schools of thought. All of them come down to around even pace. So you can be slightly negative or slightly positive, but you're going to come down to around even pace. Otherwise, it's, you know, uh, it's impossible to do it. As we are at an hour and 32 minutes here, five laps to go, just under five laps. What, what are the factors here in this last stretch of the race? What can go wrong? Everything. <laughs> yeah, everything. Everything. Everything can yeah. go wrong now. Yeah. The wheels can come completely off to, uh, uh, to take the metaphor that Ed had used in, in describing the shoes as, as feeling like wheels. Uh, 
Yeah, this is, this is the toughest part of any marathon. Uh, I don't care who you are. You mentioned your own experience. And, um, you know, he's, he's, left, he's left no room for himself, right? He's put it out there on the line. Uh, he's run the pace that he was asked to run. And he's in completely uncharted territory, as Ed said. No one has any idea what it feels like uh, to be at this point. Now, he does have one data point, which is when they ran a, a, a bit of a test run here, and he ran a 59.17 half marathon afterwards. They said, how did it feel? He said, oh, I was running 60% effort. Well, if 60% effort got him to 59.17, maybe he can be at this point of the race and still be feeling pretty good. I don't know. He looks good, right? He looks strong. And his face hasn't lied the entire time. Ed, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Hopefully we will be, we will be toasting history and we'll take an, another look here uh, at what we've been talking about, this importance of this last seven kilometers. The marathon is 42 kilometers. And the last seven kilometers are extremely difficult. The body has undergone pounding, pounding on the joints, pounding on the legs, and the mind just wanders. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't really want to complete this marathon. That's really when the energy that's stored with inside your muscles is gone away. So that's why if people don't take on nutrition throughout the race, they get to that point and they've just got nothing left. To use a running term, they'll bonk. You have to pump your arms, you have to move your torso. You're just doing everything you can to keep one foot hitting in front of the other. Your body's screaming stop, your head's screaming stop, your mind's screaming stop, everything's telling you to stop. The mind will take over and say, body, you must keep going. I'm gonna venture over the wall, see what happens, and I'm gonna go for it. as we are joined now by Alex Hutchinson from Runner's World. And uh, Alex, as Ed Caesar just pointed out, in this moment right now, uh, at this mark, we are in uncharted waters. Yeah, every step they're taking now, this is the fastest a human has ever run. So it's, it's pretty cool at this point. You've, you've thought a lot about the science of this. You've written about it. Uh, tell us exactly what's going on with him now. Uh, what's his body feeling and what's his mind thinking? Yeah, there's, there's, this is the area where physical, the physical challenges of the marathon become unique. So he, even though we're a little bit chilly standing here, uh, he's probably heating up. He's, he's an engine. He's, he's an engine running hot. Uh, his fuel, even though he's been drinking every few kilometers, he's, his fuel stores are running low. And his leg muscles are getting damaged. Uh, and this is one of the factors where maybe the, the, the shoes are going to help him avoid some of that damage. But mentally, too. I mean, if you play a video game for two hours, you'll be exhausted. These guys are trying to, or, or Elliot at this point in particular, is trying to keep his finger in that candle flame uh, for a very long time. How much did, did his training help him get to this moment? Because I know that he's run 40 kilometers on a regular basis uh, at, at 7,000 feet, 2,500 meters of altitude at times. Uh, you know, running around uh, 223 marathon pace. Uh, does that specific training get you ready for this moment? Yeah, there's no substitute for, for feeling the specific pain you're going to feel. You can't fake it. So. You can't protect yourself from muscle damage unless you've experienced that muscle damage. That, that repeated bout effect means that if you've experienced it once, it won't be as bad the next time. And mentally, too, if you, if you haven't been there, you won't be ready for the punches that, that the marathon is going to throw at you. We saw earlier in the, in the piece that uh, on Elliot Kipchoge, he, he talked about how much this is mental. For him, it starts in that mental space more than it is uh, physically. And how much is that really come into play in this type of a moment. Yeah, I think it's been really fascinating to hear Elliot's comments uh, over the last few months saying that it's really about belief, that he chooses to believe that he can do it. And, you know, I think we're learning, scientists are learning these days, the role that mental fatigue and motivation can play. So he, he's clearly very strong in the mind. And, and you know, if you, if you sit and talk to him, 
there's this aura of, of confidence and calmness that it's not a, it's not a put on. He 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 believes he can do it, and and that's going to be crucial over the next 20 minutes. Yeah, it's funny you use the word aura. The first time I met him, uh, there was this sense about him that that there was a charisma about him as an athlete. It was just prior to his victory in Rio, and. Uh, you know, uh, calm is, is the word that I would use uh, in, in the face of what was going to be a very challenging marathon in the heat of Rio. Uh, here, of course, a different sort of challenge, and we see him trying to hold on to the pacers. Yeah, we're, it looks like we're getting to the real crunch time. And, and you know, uh, as for that aura, it's really interesting to wonder, what, what, you know, which came first? Did, does, does winning the Olympics give you that, that calmness that you can do anything, or do yeah. you have to have that before you can even get to that stage? As we see, they're almost uh, lapping Elisa with and, four laps to go. And you know what I identified as maybe him slipping back really was him giving space for the uh, pacers to come in. And he's, he's really uh, uh, become an expert at, at facilitating the pacing strategy, making room for those pacers to come in and then getting right in the key zone so that he can take get the best draft off of the Pacers. And, and I'm really impressed with how well the Pacers are sticking together. They, they've run each each section, they've, they've kept in a perfect arrowhead, and that's something that wasn't so, so well executed back at the, the rehearsal in, in March. So the, the Pacers are doing their job, and now it's, now it's up to Elliot. And that was a learning from that practice, and that's one reason the group came to Monza to sort of pick up, pick up that learning. And we talked about earlier that while there is pacing in some of the major city marathons, a lot of times it falls apart. Uh, it doesn't provide the shield from the wind that the that the runners would like. I, I'm interested in his in his training because the continuity that he's had with the same coach Patrick Sang through his entire career, and the philosophy that they have, which they call uh, progressing slowly by slowly, uh, really struck me that. Um, they're very, very conscious about taking rest days and that you can't run at your maximum every day. In fact, you should never run at your 100% maximum in training. Yeah, I mean, obviously we, we've heard so much about how on their easy days they go easy, but even on the hard days, Elliot is one of those guys who always has another gear, and I think that's, you know, that's a real differentiator, that he's not racing his workouts. He's, he's using his workouts as a way of getting faster, and, and when his coach tells him, run this fast, that's how fast he runs. He doesn't view it as a challenge to see if he can go faster. You know, a lot of people were getting... Um, uh, very focused on the notion that this race wasn't on a, a specific day. You know, it might have been today, it might have been the next day, it might have been the day after, all because of weather considerations. And they said to him, hey, doesn't that, isn't that difficult? Because you don't have that one date to focus on. Uh, and he was very nonchalant about it. He says, my job is to train uh, and make sure I'm fit, and I'll run when they tell me the race is going to take place. <laughs> Yeah, he's been very trusting in the process. Uh, he's he, he, throughout, you know, it, any of the details you ask him, he says, look, I, I know what my job is, and I know what their job is, and, and I'll do my job. With under 20 minutes or so to go to possibly witness history, what would this mean for running in the world, this, this moment? Yeah, I, and I, I think we're gonna we're gonna find that out it, when, when it happens because there's so much. I, I think there's been very few people who really believed it would happen, and here we are, 20 minutes out, and it's it's within range. And I think people are gonna be processing it for a long time, trying to understand what just happened if it does in fact happen, and and how does that translate into other major marathons? Will will there be learnings from this that they can take and say, you know what? we're going to start having an arrowhead pacing formation or we're going to change our start time or, or we're going to take something from this to try and go faster. And we mentioned the Bannister analogy earlier. You know, after Roger Bannister ran sub four minutes, it was only a matter of days before someone else did it. And, of course, over time, many, many people have done it. Literally over 2,000 people have done it. Uh, so it, just, uh, it was uh, Galen Rupp who said it just takes one time to give the world the belief that it can be done. And that belief, as well as some of these technical aspects, uh, can really push the boundaries and continue to push the boundaries of marathoning. Yeah, and, and interestingly, you know, the year before Bannister broke the four-minute mile, he, he, he did a, a race where he had a pacers just like here jumping in and out that got him very close. And he, what he wrote later is that that gave him the belief that he could do it the next year. Exactly. He ran 4.02, I believe, at that, in that race.
you know, there have been analogies to the the moonshot. People have used that or, or trip to Mars. And I, I think uh, talking about the product that, uh, you know, what people don't remember about going to the moon was it, it, it did all sorts of things in, the fi in, in a variety of fields, right? It accelerated the development of the semiconductor. It miniaturized computers. Uh, they even created uh, freeze-dried foods to, for the astronauts to take. And I think this attempt, uh, to the point you were making earlier, has done the same thing. It's accelerated uh, the development of apparel, of footwear, uh, of, of some of the thoughts about how to run faster, whether it be the pacing strategies or other things. So regardless of what happens in the next 16 minutes or so, uh, those, those, are, those are there to stay. Those developments are there to stay. Yeah, and I think there's been a lot of people have had dreams about this kind of thing. That going back to the early 90s when people started talking about could someone run a sub two hour marathon and here's some of the things you could do. This is the chance to see the ground truth. This is to sit to find out, do these things help enough? Of course, you know, the other question will be how much of it is uh, that Elliot Kipchoge is just a, you know, a once in a lifetime. Are we witnessing something that, that no one will be able to do for another generation or is or are there some other things that other people will be able to follow? This is truly incredible uh, from where we started in the dark this morning. There was some light dr drizzle. Uh, th there was some fear that perhaps some rain would, would make its way north. That didn't happen. Uh, we, we've seen this, this incredible pace, and we are on the brink of history in seeing this two-hour mark broken, the fastest marathon ever run. Mr. Hutchinson, thank you so much. For, for joining us. Hopefully we will too be celebrating with you shortly and we will throw it down to Kevin Hart. Oh, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm in awe. I'm in awe at what I'm seeing. I'm in awe at the fact that history is about to be made. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I don't even see if you guys, if you're not looking at the time, look at the time. It looks like this will be done. I mean, this, this, yeah, you should make noise. Noise should be made. I want us to really understand why this is happening. It's because I'm here. My essence is in the air. And I have put that essence on this track. In return, they are taking that essence and pushing themselves to the limit. What I'm saying is that Kevin Hart makes everybody better. Okay? So you over there, I'm throwing all you guys some of this Kevin Hart. You take it. You take it, and I want y'all to throw that Kevin Hart that I just threw y'all, and you throw it on the track. Let's push these men to greatness today. We are pushing them to greatness. We are here, and we are breaking too. It is unbelievable. We're coming down to the finishing marks. Stay with me. I'm excited. You get excited. I'm throwing it back to you, because I'm watching history right now. Let's go. Oh, my God, that car's going fast. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Kevin. Let's go! I think that uh, he felt the essence of blur. I saw Kipchoge take that from you, Kevin Hart. As we have two laps to go, we are joined now by Shalane Flanagan, four-time Olympian. Shalane, uh, what's it been like for you witnessing this as we get closer and closer to this being reality? I have chills, and not because it's chilly outside. I am just so inspired right now. I have butterflies in my stomach. I am just sending all my energy to Elliot and the Pacers to execute right now. Um, I can't believe I'm here. I feel very lucky and very fortunate to be here to witness this today. Well, it, it, it is amazing history no matter what, right? He's pr currently projected to run just over two hours. Uh, two hours and 10 seconds at the moment. Uh, there have been some moments where it looked like he was having a little trouble hanging on. Uh, you were down at trackside, I think. Did, did, have you gotten any sense of, of, of his rhythm and how he's hanging in there with the Pacers? Um, so from my perspective, in general, he has just looked in that Zen flow of state. Um, I have seen a little bit of wincing. I couldn't tell if it was smiling, but I think it was a little bit of wincing, unfortunately. Um, his body language, though, from the start, and even now, even just falling off just a little bit, his body language is that of just having still a lot of control. 
when we had Ed Caesar up here earlier, he, he, he made a good point. He said, no matter what happens, even if we don't uh, see this, this two hour mark broken, this has never happened before. This opens the door to, to what is truly possible. Yeah, with each step that he's taking, he is breaking history, which is phenomenal to think about as an athlete. I hope he's appreciating right now. I know he's probably having to rally mentally. He's going to that place. He may have a personal mantra today to get him through the rough patches. Um, I know I do when I have marathons um, that I'm preparing for. I have my go-to little sayings to kind of get me through these rough patches. Um, but with each step and each each moment, he is making history regardless. Well, we talk about putting it in perspective, and, and we talked about it earlier that uh, to go from 206 to 202.57 uh, took about 16 years. So if you just project that forward, and that, that, that world record was set in, in 2014, it would have taken to 2030 to get under two hours and to break this barrier. Uh, Runner's World did a study, they, 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 they crunched the numbers and they estimated, they looked at 10,000 marathon performances that it would take until 2075 to break two hours. And so the fact that he's, he's close, he's so close right now to that two hour barrier, it it's just sort of opens the mind of human potential. How does it motivate you as an athlete, um, you know, to, to, to think about him taking on this challenge? It's the fact that he has made this commitment and um, he may not achieve this goal, but the fact that he has stated that he wants to break this barrier and he wants to be the man, um, I think it just shows every person, not even just the runners and athletes, um, that everyone has a two, a sub two barrier and in their life and whatever they want to achieve. And so I think this inspires people to think, what is my sub two? and how can I start to dream and think bigger than I thought was possible. So he's going to inspire millions of people today. So I, in these last stages of the race, this is really where the mental toughness comes to play. Um, I think right now, knowing that he's the last athlete um, is really tough to not have you know the, the competitors around him. He's just locked into the Pacers. Um, this is the, the toughest part mentally. And when you think about the fact that they really prepared for this together and they've been on this journey together for the last couple of years, uh, as much as he wants to be the one to win, he is also running for them. He is, he, he wants to be the guy. He wants to, um, there's a lot of people when athletes step to the line that support them. And I think in these moments, they are thinking about the people that have helped them get to this point. And um, they're drawing the energy and trying to exhibit, um, this is giving thanks to the people that have helped them. What about the job uh, that the, this, this pacing team has done today, which has just been seamless and they look to have just put their all out there? Yeah, they've they've delivered and over delivered. You know, the the system needed to be perfected, and that's why the test run uh, taught people a lot about how to how to make it run. Uh, the fact that these uh, runners disrupted their racing calendars to come here and be part of this effort, I think, speaks to how the running community and elite runners feel about the importance of this effort. Uh, who, who's to say that one of the runners in the pacing group might one day be chasing the two-hour barrier themselves? Uh, and what I love is you hear the chatter out there, you know, people talking among themselves, encouraging, uh, encouraging them to sort of keep it going, encouraging him to stay with them. Um, and, you know, here it comes. I mean, we're coming up now to one lap to go uh, as to whether history can be made. And, and this is where it's really important to talk about the fact uh, that in the London Marathon, he's run sub 440 miles uh, in the last two miles because that's, that's what he's uh, facing now, is having to deliver those kind of performances uh, as, as he comes up to this last lap. And you could hear the, the cheers from those remaining pacers there at the tent. They were screaming at the top of their lungs for him. They're, everyone here is very invested, and especially these men pacing, these athletes, they feel as much a part of it as anyone. Um, they're very much invested. They want to be say that they helped um, this effort today and have dreams come true. 
I have those butterflies. <laughs> For sure. Uh, my, 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 my skin is, is starting to stand up and I can, can feel it all throughout my body as we are knocking on the door of history here in our last lap. But reality, reality is setting in. He's now at, at two hours, 19 seconds expected time, and he's going to have to deliver an Elliot Kipchoge kind of finish. Uh, he has been a finisher in his career, whether it was his track career where he won that sort of groundbreaking 5,000-meter victory at the World Championships as an 18-year-old, uh, showing incredible speed at the finish, or his marathon victories where he always finishes with a flourish. He always has something back, but uh, something left. But uh, imagine the strain at this point, having gotten this far uh, and having you know less than, than 2.4 kilometers to go uh, what he's got to rally and pull together. As you see here, he, he still looks very collected, um, but every now and then you see a little bit of a wince, and um, I'm wondering if he's, he's feeling like he can pull together um, a big last effort in the, big, in the last lap here. You know, he's expressed his love for the marathon. And, he, you know, he says that marathon is, is life. It's a big journey uh, every time you run it. And he says you feel a lot of pain, but you think a lot of things to get past that pain. Uh, and when talking about this attempt, he said, you know, the gap is psychological. And clearly it's not only psychological at this point, but he's going to need to use his brain to will himself physically to stay with these guys and to get to that two-hour two barrier. How hard is it to dig deep for that extra, that, that extra more at, at a time like this? It's exceptionally hard. Um, you know, I've had my coach before say, Shalane, why can't you just dig a little deeper? Come on, it's there. Um, but there are limitations to the human body. Um, but the mind, this is the crucial time where it has to override those signals, where the legs are saying, please, please slow down. Um, and it's hard to ignore when your body is telling you that it does not want to move faster. Um, but knowing that he has about five minutes left of running, that's what I do. I break it down into how many minutes I have. And so if he knows, if he looks up at the clock and he says, okay, I've only got five minutes of running, you know, Elliot, you can do this and think back to his training and all the tough moments that he's gotten through. This is the crucial time to use, um, draw from experience. And he's been put in this situation many times um, and he has come through um, with huge huge performances so right now you see his eyes getting eyes getting bigger he's taking his last bit of fluid I imagine right here and hopefully sometimes when you take the last little bit of fluid you get a little energy surge you get the sugars in your mouth and you can almost rally and feel a little bit better after taking some of those fluids so well, this is incredible it's down to four minutes now or less than four minutes of running it, you know, you talked about this, and, 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 and people wrote about it. People literally wrote a book about it. Uh, and, and here it is. It's within his grasp. Uh, and as you say, occasional grimace, almost an occasional smile on his face. He's still in that Zen state. You know, I wondered uh, if the fact that it was not competitive would make a difference. This guy, among everything else that he is as a great athlete, is a fantastic competitor. And the fact that it was uh, running for a barrier, not running to win, uh, would that make a difference? But he seems to still be competing out there. And I, I, that's why I still think the possibility, as he's now slipped to 2 hours and 23 seconds uh, for the projected finish time, I think it's still possible because this is a guy who has finished time and time again uh, with great speed. And you can see uh, those different moments in his face uh, where, you, as you mentioned before, it, sometimes a grimace and then all of a sudden it, it looks like a, a calm a smile in the midst of the fire. And looking at his leg turn of arm, I mean, that's perfection right there as... I mean, it, he's graceful and beautiful, even though he's hurting so bad, his form is not breaking down. It really is a beautiful piece of artwork to watch him run. You can see the Pacers turning around, cheering him on, very much invested in this.
you know, he'll see the finish line from quite a distance when he comes around the turn. And, and that's when, you know, his natural tendency to finish will come in into play. I don't know if there's enough room left to make up uh, what is the distance that he'll have to make up. And now he's about 27 seconds uh, over the projected finish time of, of, of uh, or the goal of two hours. Uh, but when he, when he looks up and sees the finish, you have to think that there'll be a spring in his step. When we arrived here this morning, it was in the hopes of witnessing what was possible. What is possible when you take an idea of a barrier that has not been crossed before? What is possible if you just give it a try? And he now can see the finish line and you saw them pointing, encouraging him, everyone alongside, urging him on. In a way, it's a victory lap because what he's achieved is extraordinary. Two years in the making on this journey. He started as three with Lelisa de Sisa and Zersine Tedese. And now, Elio Kipchoge with the Pacers still encouraging him to dig deep. And he's trying, he's trying to sprint here, which is incredible. You can see him go to his arms, pulling him up higher. I call him the sprint hands. This is as much of a sprint um, as anything right here that you'll see on the track. An extraordinary effort. He still looks so incredible. I can't. I can't even fathom right now. And holding the finish line tape is Joan Benoit Samuelson and Allison Felix. Both of them barrier breaker breakers in their own right. Yes. And there's the smile. And he's still jogging. <laughs> <laughs> the intensity in his face in that sprint. I'll so never forget that. His final time is two hours and 24 seconds. Today we found out what else is possible. Yeah, the official world record 202.57. Uh, this will not count for record purposes, but what it did do was show humans what is possible in this event. And uh, this man did something incredible that will, will last forever. Well, I'm inspired to go run today. I don't know about you guys, but... He spoke about it being a, a mental journey, more than it was physical. And in all those pieces we watched, And Elliot Kipchoge, Elliot Kipchoge is with Paula at the finish line, who <laughs> now I think is going to have to go on a little sprint to chase him. <laughs> Elliot, can we just have a quick word for, for the camera? <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, you, you just want to thank the, the guys for part of the team that has really been around you here today. But I just want you, if, if you can, because I, I know what that's taken out of you, to try and put into words because the world has only just learned about the target that you've been working towards for, for two years and you really laid everything on the line there and you broke some huge barriers. I mean, you smashed the world record. So you have to believe going forward now <coughs> that you can go and officially do that two hours 25. Are you already thinking about that 25 seconds and where you can make that up next time? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you all the best as well, actually. Uh, give out their energy and their minds to help me to go all through this journey of two kilometers. But, uh, <coughs> sorry, the, 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 actually, the second which is above, actually, I can say, uh, uh, I hope next time, it's, I can say it's possible for a human to run under, under, under two, two, two hour mark. But uh, I'm, I, I was aiming to run one fifth and a half. 
but I'm happy to have run a two in marathon. Yes. It's a phenomenal achievement uh, and a very inspiring performance. Uh, we saw a lot of you on the screen and we could see the screen, if you like, of, of your face, but behind that, the emotions going through your head. Can you try and, and put into words how you felt on the last lap when you could see the time ahead of you and, and what you were aiming for? Uh, uh, my mind fully was uh, under two hours, but uh, in the last two laps, I was a little bit uh, 10 seconds uh, uh, behind the schedule. Uh, and the last lap, uh, I was also uh, a little bit behind the schedule, and a lot was running out of my mind. This, uh, this journey has been good. Uh, it has been hard. It's, uh, it has taken actually seven good months of preparation, of dedication, and, and, and of everything. But uh, I'm happy to have done that. Um, and I, I think this history in, the, uh, in, 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 matters, in matters of sport. Yes. No, I think you, you've made history today and you've inspired so many of us and we've seen a glimpse of, of what is possible. So back to you in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, one of my favorite things I heard that he said was when he was talking about the Pacers, he said, thank you for lending me your, your bodies and your minds. Yeah, you know, we, we, we can't emphasize enough. We've talked about it uh, many times today that this was a team effort. It started from his own team, his coach, who's been with him since literally he was a, a boy, uh, his training partners, um, and, and then the group that became part of his family, the other runners, and the scientists who, who worked with him and guided him and he listened so carefully to, as we look at him with uh, Sandy Bodecker, who started the race and, and, and visioned in many ways this attempt. And... Um, <laughs> pointing out the tattoo. Uh, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is what makes it special. I think it's what makes the sport special. It's a global community. And, um, and Paul has said it really well, that, that the whole world was behind this and supporting this and wanting to see what was possible. As we see Zersene Tedese who hung in there, that, that, that initial group stayed together uh, for a long time. And yeah, and we, he's going to run his personal best by a few minutes. So I think the, the strategy of, of uh, training specifically for this, of, of the fluid intake, which uh, had been a problem for him in, in his, some of his marathon attempts, uh, he, he didn't do what he wanted to do, which was be side by side with Elliot Kipchoge, but he's going to come away with a, a personal best at this distance. I think having prepared for this event will only elevate his marathoning career for the future. I think these athletes learned an incredible amount of information and information about themselves and what's possible. And I think Zersene had some of the most to learn. And I think from here forward, you're going to see just better and better marathons. Well, as you said, to be able to, un under these circumstances, run his personal best, that's a, a huge takeaway moving forward. I think everyone is always very grateful to finish a marathon as you see him um, appreciate the fact that he is done right now. A moment with the scientists who he's come to know over time and, and He's embraced uh, their advice, uh, and, and, and as Shalane says, changed his prospects at this marathon distance. Yeah, we you talked about that, that buy-in for someone who, uh, for f fluid was something he, that he didn't even think about really uh, as being important as we see uh, the Lisa de Sisa being brought up by this last group of Pacers, but him having to take that, that full buy-in to change the whole manner in, in, in which he prepares.
with all the, the, the questions that we, we had as to how the, the pacing system would, would, would work and the, the in and outs of the switches, there wasn't one moment in, in which the, it did not go perfectly smoothly as executed. It was a flawless production and um, it was beautiful to watch how seamless it seemed to flow and um, as an athlete, uh, it's always, you feed off of the energy if the flow is good um, and there's no altercations. It just keeps the heart rate down, you stay relaxed. Um, it was, a, the execution today was beautiful. And I love the camaraderie of the of the Pacers, and, and you saw in the in the home stretch when they were urging him on. You know, they felt so much part of this effort, and they were they were a critical part of it. I had dinner um, with the Pacers the other night uh, at the hotel, and they seemed. I walked in and I was like, "Well, this is um, a running camp essentially with a bunch of men," and um, so it was about you know 36 men there and having dinner and. Um, they seem to be having a really good time this week together. And what a moment it is for Kipchoge and also a, a lot of these fans who came from around Europe uh, to, to have a chance at, at witnessing this moment. It's a very intimate setting that we're in right now, so to be able to go up and hug Elliot right now and touch a piece of history, um, what an honor to get a high five from this man today. Or sign some shoes. <laughs> Those shoes are gonna have to get a security detail. <laughs> I think he's writing beyond limits uh, <laughs> on it. And they're going to make just as much noise, this, this crowd, uh, when DeCisa comes across that finish line. Here's a two-time Boston Marathon champ, and it just shows how humbling the marathon can be on certain days. I call it the marathon gods, and sometimes the marathon gods are with you, and sometimes they're not. And um, Elisa put forward an unbelievable effort today, and, um, but it's, the last 10K is very, very hard, no matter what. You could see that he was laboring. Uh, in his stride. I noticed early on um, he was perspiring much more than the other athletes um, today and so to me that's a sign that he was maybe working a little bit harder sooner. Um, his jersey was sticking to him um, whereas Elliot's was uh, flowing a little bit differently so um, but I noticed about 50 minutes in he was um, having to work harder than the other athletes. And, and when those running gods do come for you in the middle of the race and you know that it's going to be a long struggle, what, what is that like when you have to sort of yield to it and there's nothing mentally left that you can do to get past that? It's, it's a very tough position to be in. I have been in it. And um, I think I just focus on, um, you know, just focusing on each step forward and forward momentum and um, looking forward to maybe something as simple as my next fluid station, something to get excited about. <laughs> and um, I think about the people who have helped me get here and sometimes the day is just about finishing. Um, it, that's just how the nature of the sport is and this distance, it's very humbling. We're at the two minute, two hours and 12 minute mark. And just about 400 meters to go. And I think this moment speaks for itself. I mean, this is one of the best runners in the world. Debuted with a 204 marathon, two time Boston winner. And I think Shalane makes a fantastic point about what this distance can do to you. It makes, it actually puts in perspective what Elliot Kipchoge achieved. Uh, they all set out with the same goal today. Uh, they all were seen to have the potential to do, to become the first sub two hour marathoner. One guy came so close. And for Elisa DeCisa, the youngest athlete of the group, the future 
could give him another shot. It's certainly the hardest way to run a marathon when you're going out at two hour pace and you, it's not your day. Um, it's extremely hard. Um, you've gone in a hole and you're in the tank and then you're having to claw your way to the finish line just because you have run so exceptionally hard for the first hour like he already did. And lots of respect to him for finishing oh, yes. the race. It would have been very Absolutely. easy to drop out. Mm. big things from Luisa in the future here. I think there's a lot that he's learned from the scientists and from this training and um, he's the future. We will allow the athletes uh, to, to gather themselves uh, and get some recovery and then we will have a actual award ceremony for today and uh, we will recap uh, this race and what an incredible morning that it's been. It's been an, an, an honor to be here with, with you guys and, uh, and, and witness this. And to think that we were out here in the, in the dark and there was all this energy uh, of the unknown at about 4.30 this morning. Uh, and to come so close to knocking on that door of, of the breaking two, but now to really find out that there's, there's a whole lot more that is possible. So my question is, will this opportunity exist again? That's what I want to know as a fan of the sport. I want to see another attempt. I know it's probably too soon, but um, this is so inspiring and so incredible. And I feel like we are, it's, you can taste the sub two. Um, and today shows that we're very, very close. So um, I'm curious to see what will happen in the future. As we uh, await uh, these athletes getting prepared for the award ceremony, uh, how about we take a look at uh, some of the highlights, uh, some of the key moments uh, from today. First off, we'll, we'll start with the Pacers. And you know, we've, uh, we've said it uh, several times, this was the complicated part of this race. Uh, we knew that uh, shielding the runners from, from the wind uh, giving them a pocket of, of, of protection to run in was going to be incredibly important. Uh, it was a bold plan that was executed perfectly. And, um, you know, the, the, the love and care that these fellow runners showed for the three men that were making the attempt uh, was really special. And those transitions, each one seamless. And none of the, the athletes ever got caught up with, it, with each other. It was perfect. It's a perfect position and place to be tucked in right behind. You're getting the energy off of the other athletes. And it's very um, motivating and inspiring to feel that energy and that flow. And here you see waving them on, encouragement throughout the entire race. Keeping the moment light, even in the uh, greatest moment of struggle towards the end of the race. And you know, he did pick the pace up over, over the last part. How he managed to do that, I don't know, given how his legs must have been screaming. Joan Benoit Samuelson holding the tape. You know, herself an incredible barrier breaker. First woman to win the Olympic marathon. Set multiple world records uh, in the event and uh, it was great for her to be there at that moment. Absolutely. She set the stage for inspiring me and my career and showing what's possible. So whenever I'm dreaming of a big moment for myself, I think of the women before me and having the opportunity to 
um, ha do what I do and what I love. What's your takeaway uh, for, for you? I know you said you're excited to go and run today, but moving forward, uh, what, what's your takeaway? Not having my own mental barriers and trying to dream really big dreams and not having putting any limitations on myself and what I'm capable of. I think it showed that these athletes committed to um, a pace that they've never run before and raced at. And so why can't I go back home and say, you know, maybe my barrier is a 220 marathon. So what is that pace? So it's, two, it's 519 a mile. So I'm going to commit in my training to try to always run 519 a mile and maybe I can break through to that barrier. Well, and several people said it, you know, that this translates to all runners and, in fact, all people. Uh, that's what barrier breaking does. And you know, we talked about some of the great barriers in, in the history of, of running, and one of the early pieces uh, talked about other great barriers, 500 home runs, for example, or 100 points in a basketball game. Those are out there. And, and someone having achieved those, those uh, in the case of baseball, many times, or in the case of, of 100 points in basketball, only mm -hmm. one time. But it's still there. It gives people something to shoot for. And, and that's a, a lesson for life. In the sports uh, that I've had the privilege of coming from uh, in my career, in, in snowboarding and skateboarding and surfing, th there's a lot of these moments that have never been done. And when an athlete's had to work so hard for a trick that people have thought is impossible, like Tony Hawk's uh, 900 or Travis Pastrana when he did the double backflip, those moments uh, shifted and changed the entire sport and made it possible for people to add on to that and, and do more. They, they, wouldn't, they were never the type of moments where they were one and done. It literally opened the way for people to really find out what's possible. And it's, it's, I, I feel the same kind of moment in, in, in right now as, as in getting to witness those. So, so right now, uh, we talk about the body being depleted uh, at, at this finish line. What do you need to do to get rehydrated? Well, they did a great job of hydrating while they were on the course. They got fluids more frequently than in a major marathon. So, but there still is going to be a loss of water weight. So they are now trying to get warm again. Um, they will be sipping fluids. It's a little tough. Sometimes the stomach is not happy after marathon, so you're sipping water and trying to get it back in, but it's not necessarily the first thing you want to do. Um, so it's just refueling the tank again. Um, and most likely they will be um, going through some drug testing now, so there's, they definitely need to get the fluids in so that they can produce a sample. When we talk about the contributions that this effort makes, you know, one of them will be in, this, in the fact that these fluids were personalized. They studied the athletes. I know Paula was talking about it. They put, put them in, in controlled conditions, running on a treadmill uh, in certain humidity. To, they would try to mimic this. They saw what kind of body weight uh, they would lose through, through fluids. And there we see, excuse me, Craig, the, the, the Pacers uh, making their way across the, the finish line, all of them. That given is the chair incredible. to Kipchoge. And that's the brotherhood we talked about. It truly was a global effort today and to see um, like you said, the camaraderie and just how much they care about one another. And they're inspired by the three athletes who are making this attempt. And I think a lot of these athletes are going to leave inspired by today's effort and bring it back to their own training. And hopefully they have some great performances this year based off of, you know, when I go to major marathons, I get inspired, even if I'm not racing. And I go home and I come back to my training with this new sense of purpose and, and vigor. Um, and I believe the athletes here today um, that help pace will, I think, step up their game and their training. That smile. There wasn't one time today that they didn't look like just a unified 
unit. Everybody wants a piece of this history yes. too. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pictures being taken right now. I was there. They'll be able to, to, to look back on this moment and say I was there and I, I contributed. And this is really a, a contribution to the future. I, I really believe that you know, we'll be able to, to, to see whether it's a year or, or a few years from now, look back at, at this moment and they'll be able to say we were there at that turning point. Or we contributed to the acceleration of, of the drive towards the two-hour barrier, whether it is a year or, or a 10 years. Right. Rem remember, some thought it would take until 2075 uh, to, to achieve this barrier. And he came so close in 2017. We talked a little bit about it uh, in, in the beginning of the race, the, the, the specialty of, of, of their unique running styles amongst these three, and, and we'll, we'll take a look at this right now. How would you break down uh, the differences in the way they move? <laughs> um, I would say Elliot for sure has a flow. Um, his posture is pretty much perfect. Um, he he, his legs are like a little sewing machine, up and down, up and down. Um, Belisa definitely has a little bit of a turn in the upper body torso, but I think the important thing when you're analyzing athletes is what do they look like from the waist down. Paula Radcliffe, the world record holder for the women, um, has a different upper body kind of twist, but if you look from the waist down, she's perfect. Um, so that's the most important component, and it's all about efficiency, and um, trying to change someone's form is very difficult. Whatever um, kind of running form is innate to them is the most efficient, in a sense. You don't try to change someone. Um, but yeah, they you can tell them apart by their running form, for sure, the three different athletes. But part of the science of this was to find three of the most economical or efficient runners even if their forms were different, uh, to Shalane's point, they were very efficient as runners, not wasting energy. And then benefiting, of course, from the many uh, different advantages that they were given, whether it's the apparel that they're wearing or the footwear or the pacers or the, or the, or the course. As you see, uh, Zersene there, when, you, when you've had this kind of day where it's been challenging, what's the, re what's the, the, the moving forward recovery like? Uh, this is a crucial time to get, like we were talking about, rehydrated if they've lost um, some water weight, um, getting a meal in at some point. I like a good juicy burger. I don't know what these men will be choosing for tonight. Um, but it's all about getting warm again as well. The muscles, there's been a lot of breakdown and fatigue and muscle damage. So you'll be watching these men walk around very gingerly. Stairs are a marathoner's worst nightmare. Um, but because there was not a lot of course elevation change, um, they potentially will recover faster. However, um, it was a very fast pace. So uh, that will do some damage to the muscles. They were in uncharted territory. And I think in Zersene's uh, case, uh, he'll go back and he'll evaluate uh, how he felt, how he prepared, how he felt. Uh, he, he should be happy with a four-minute four improvement over his p personal best, uh, but he'll look for the things that didn't go well for him today and think about where he goes next, whether it's to the very comfortable half-marathon distance where he's been dominant and is the world record holder, or does he take another shot at the marathon uh, to see if he can take what he learned here and move to the next level, as Shalane said. And as you said, that, that four minutes is not, it's not a small deal uh, to, to, to knock off your personal That's best. That's to be celebrated for sure. Anytime, even if it's a few seconds, um, a PR is a PR, and that's a special day. It's the fastest you've ever run, and 
um, you can never take those for granted. So to celebrate um, uh, it is necessary today. And I, I, I love uh, the, the, the way the Pacers are just, just relentless, making sure we get all the documentation necessary uh, of this moment. As we are on standby for our official award ceremony in about seven minutes or so. Again, this morning when we, we showed up, there was, there was some light drizzle and it, it, there was some rain to the south of us and there was a little bit of a buzz around here that it, that it might make its way north. You could see people a little bit stressed out and, and as, as soon as that sun rose, I mean, we, we couldn't have asked for a better day. This is perfect running conditions. And I even think, um, I've, I've heard that the extra little moisture in the air from the rain is actually great for the runners. It actually uh, a little more oxygen needed. And um, so I can't imagine better running conditions. When I woke up this morning, I'm like, man, this is, setting up to be a perfect day. Yeah, Paula was talking about that effect of, of the rain and uh, it harkens back to the uh, 1968 Olympics when Bob Beeman uh, had his incredible long jump and there was a torrential downpour just before it and, and many people thought that the, the negative ions created by the, the storm uh, contributed to his breakthrough performance and uh, it was only a light drizzle here and, and, and wasn't of the same magnitude but we uh, definitely had just perfect conditions and, and that's all speaks to the research that went into choosing this place at this time um, and and making the call to go forward with the race uh, maybe with a little bit of uncertainty about uh, whether that rain would come in uh, and it was clearly the right call and of course the the choice of of here at Monza you know this this perfectly flat surface and, and, and taking advantage of this track and the athletes not having to think about potholes and, and, and things of that nature and, and really getting to try and test this technology uh, in, 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 in as controlled and, and close to perfect setting as possible to try and, uh, and, and break this barrier. These are beautiful pictures yeah. because you see, you see what he went through, and, and and we commented during the race. Sometimes he appeared to be smiling, sometimes he appeared to be grimacing, but he he was always he had a sense in control, and he would get himself back on focus, on task, uh, in the zone. Yeah, there was more than one moment where you could see him, literally choose to smile, uh, and, and and put himself back in that state. There are my teammates, Andrew Bumbleau and Chris Derrick of Bowerman Track Club. And um, they've been here all week preparing with Lopez Lamong. And um, certainly will be a highlight, I know, of their year and will fuel their training when we get back to work back home in Portland, Oregon. This was a very nice little workout for a lot of these men today. <laughs> when I asked them how they were feeling about coming out to pace, they said, this is going to be a good hard workout. You know, if they were home in Portland preparing, um, this would have been dubbed as an extremely hard effort today just for training. So, um, you know, this fit nicely into their training plans. This was a great hard workout for a lot of these athletes today. And as you look outward uh, from the pacers, and then the scientists and the doctors and and so many people behind the scenes in, in this day that has really been planned for two years in, in trying to say what happens if we 
apply the science to the best athletes in the world uh, and give them a shot at breaking this barrier. Starting up the bell here in three, two, one. Here we go. Wind is the obstacle. Anytime you're having to move through air, the body has to overcome that air resistance. Aerodynamics is important because you could either modify the apparel and allow me to move more quickly through that air, or you could help displace that air by having either a body or some other object in front of me. When we shield that basic wind with people, the body needs less energy. So the goal is tall, big individuals who can run fast. We want to emphasize with you the importance of having the pacers be very close to each other. So usually you don't have the benefit of having people to draft behind for the entire distance. You might have it maybe till halfway, but then eventually you're on your own, and that's one of the reasons why people slow down later on. Okay, guys, we've lost another pacer, so can we communicate to the car to be really cautious on this back straight? These guys are the fastest in the world. To have other people try to even do half of it at the same speed has been really, really difficult. The biggest challenge is staying in formation, but also not tripping. Nobody's ever tried to facilitate pacers like that in a marathon. Don't overthink it. Keep it really simple. Help them be the best they can be, and we'll be all right. And we got to see that applied in, in its full form today, challenging the aerodynamics as we are on standby for this final award ceremony. And we talked about his incredible career in the sport of track and field, first seeing his current coach, Patrick Sang, uh, running in the tea fields, as he said, uh, when he was a little boy of eight years old and watching uh, the man who became his mentor and guide through his career uh, go on to win a silver medal in the 1992 Olympic silver medals in world championships in the steeplechase, took him under his wing, gave him uh, equipment that allowed him to start progressing through the sport and then at age 18, winning a global championship uh, in Paris, France, the 5,000 meters, uh, beating legends in the sport. And he said, I, you know, I want to spend 10 years as a track and field athlete. And he went on to win medals at Olympics and world championships at the 5,000 meter distance before saying, okay, now I'm ready to take on the marathon. And he, he moves to the marathon, has immediate success. He wins seven of eight marathons, only losing one, uh, a marathon where uh, the world record was set. Uh, winning the Olympic Games and then taking this challenge on and and what a fantastic career and he's done it by consistency working with the same group of people uh, leaving his family during the week and traveling uh, to a training camp where he lives in a very simple a simple way shares the duties of cooking and cleaning the bathroom uh, notwithstanding his, his global status as, as one of the greatest runners of all time uh, and then embracing this challenge and, and going so close to breaking that barrier. But I think as Shalana said really well, inspiring now whole new generations of runners. Well, we are going to honor uh, this day, this really historical day. And who better uh, than to make the awards presentation uh, than someone who has broken all sorts of barriers, the one and only nine-time Olympic gold medalist Carl Lewis for the presentation. Hello athletes. Well, first of all, I, 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 it, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm so excited because there, there are so few times in life when you can be a part of history. And today was history. You know, 63 years ago, Roger Bannister 
broke the four minute mile. And when he went out to do that, people said it couldn't be done, it could never happen. But he actually was a visionary and he made it happen. So a couple of years ago, all these athletes decided to be visionaries. They said, we want to try to go for something that no one's ever even thought of. Not just tried or done, but no one's even thought of. So we're, we're just so excited that they took it beyond anything that any human being could have ever imagined. You know, Nike always says that everyone's an athlete. So today, we saw the greatest marathon of every athlete on earth, seven billion people. You know, they, they change the perception of what people can do. And if a team comes together, not just the athletes themselves, but coaches, uh, people that are in their backstory, every single person that it took to make sure this wonderful day came. And you know what, it was nail biting right down to the end. And we were just so, so close because we were going f to try to break the two, min two hour marathon. I, I almost said minute because I only think in seconds. <laughs> But I'm just so excited because so what I want to do, I want to get to all the athletes and I want to just, just want to reiterate how important this day is because we're going to look back and all of you are going to look back at this moment because this was the first real attempt and no one even thought of trying it. And now when this happens someday, they'll look back and say, man, it all started today in 2017. So whether you're running your first mile or just walking, you're a part of that story that we went for today. Now, I've got some great athletes that went for the impossible that we're going to honor today. And I'm going to start with our third place gentleman, Lelisa, come on up on stage. Okay. Now let me tell you something. I'll keep it going because he could take his time. He just ran for two hours. We are on your schedule. Uh huh. There we go. There we go. Hey, I'm not seeing y'all in it. What are we doing over here? Come on. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I'll tell you something. So, so while, while we're waiting on Lisa to come up. When, when, you know, when Elliot went into his last lap and it was so close, we were just, everyone was sitting here saying, is he going to be able to kick at the end or what's he going to do or how is he feeling? I was sitting back saying, drop your arms and stroke. It's time to stroke now because it was, it was so exciting. But, but when you have a race like this, isn't it amazing how you can go for two hours and it's just chilling for two hours waiting for an inevitable? Because, you know, me being a sprinter, I used to run down the track in just 10 seconds. And I would try to figure out how can I just get one one hundredth of a second or a tenth of a second to win a race. And then when the race is over, I would go back and I'd say, what did I do if I didn't win it or I didn't run my time? What did I do? Where did I make that one mistake? And it was only over 10 seconds or less. They had two hours to think, well, what was that step wrong? Or what did I do at this point? So the concentration and focus, knowing that you're not just trying to win a race, because you're going to just win a race. You're just out there running against the people, so when you get into the lead, all of a sudden you can settle in and you, and you get comfortable, and it's like, wow, I've got it. I'm looking back and making sure I'm looking at the finish line. But when you're going after a record, when you're trying to be an inventor of something that's never been done before, your mind never stops focusing on being forward. Think about that. Even when it's great, you're still going forward. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with our first gentleman going forward. Lelisa, come on up. Yeah, up here. Yep, yep. Here, take the steps up here. Congratulations. Congratulations. So I just want to ask you a question. Am I waiting for someone to help me? Yeah, come on. Dude, he ran two hours and you can't get up here before him? <laughs> help a brother out here. 
So, so when you decided to take this challenge, what was the first thing that came to your mind? Okay, could you translate? Yeah. Um, I was uh, not feeling very well back in January and February, so probably um, I have always thought that I wanted to do this race. However, um, due to less training, um, it ended up what it has today. Well, you're, you're the youngest, right? You're the youngest athlete competing today. What, what, what is that like? based on lack of experience, but you've also had a lot of success. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's I have achieved um, what I can due to the circumstances of my two months um, illness, um, it would probably have an impact on the result. However, I am still positive that I could do much more than what I have done today. All right, well, congratulations. <laughs> okay, come up for a photo. Okay, we're not finished, we're just getting started. So next, we are going to bring up Zerzane. <laughs> Congratulations. So let me ask you a question. So how important were the pacemakers for you? today yeah uh, I would like to uh, first I would like to thank you for Nike for the support uh, uh, for the people uh, I will, uh, and the pacemakers they are uh, help us a lot uh, say thank you and uh, that is the most even the synthesis even the most important is the Chipchoga he run is very fast is the broke world record. I'm very happy for, for this because uh, we are uh, we are hard uh, together in the pace. So actually, I'm very happy uh, even uh, for the future we are learning. So I'm very happy. Okay, good. <laughs> so so let me ask you, what did you learn? What did you learn out of this whole experience? I mean, the last few months and preparing for this, that's going to make you a better athlete in the future. Uh, okay, so, uh, so then. Oh, he'll help you out. Uh, oh, yeah, help her brother out. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we are training a lot for uh, this races, this project. So uh, actually, uh, this is uh, uh, to seek something. It's, it's good for me. Uh, I'm learning for the future marathon. This is my 
best time in actually. So <laughs> Well, great. Congratulations. Let's get our shot. Congratulations. So guess what? We, we, had a, we had a chilling finish, a blistering pace. And it's, it's, it's amazing for someone like myself to watch the speed of, and the tempo of the of the running for such a long period of time and it was so riveting in here watching this saying I, I think we're gonna get it I think we're gonna get it it was so close but guess what we did get you all witnessed the fastest marathon run in history <laughs> Elliot come on up Okay, when we saw your video, you said, I want to win. You said in your video, I want to win. And you, you looked like you were determined from day one. You were focused, and you were there, and it was close all the way to the end. Just a few seconds. So how do you feel about your race? You tell me how you felt about your race. Oh, this journey has been really long journey. It has been seven months. But uh, with the rest, I feel good. But uh, the we, I didn't actually get the tucker but I, I, I am a happy man to run a marathon in two hours. So I think that the world now is just 25 seconds away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't believe that you can make up that 25 seconds. And so are you right now thinking in your mind like, where am I, where am I gonna make up that 25 seconds because I know I can do it? Where, where in your mind do you think you can make up that 25 seconds? Because it's just a little bit. Uh, I'm going to spot this. Today you are up, tomorrow you are down. And I can say with, uh, with a perfect mind and perfect training, I believe in good preparation and good planning. If you turn that, then uh, in 20, these 25 seconds will go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to, I want to thank Nike because, it, you know, um, I've been around a long, 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 long time. And this is amazing for me to be a part of this today, this historic day to see the fastest marathon ever run. Congratulations, Elliot. Thank and you. let's take our picture. Thank you very much. Okay, give him a round of applause again. Congratulations. Now back up to the booth up here. The fastest marathon ever run. And you heard the fastest marathon ever run, and you heard uh, Elliot Kipchoge say, with perfect training and preparation, preparation, those 25 seconds will be gone. I agree. He said what I loved the most was it wasn't about him, actually. He said the world is 25 seconds away, which mm -hmm. is just very meaningful to me. It's not just about him. It's about inspiring the world. It, it pulled the whole event together, I think, that comment that, that it was about the, it's about where the world is. The world now sees that it's only 25 seconds away. And again, let's, let's pay homage to what you started with. Two and a half minutes faster than a man has ever run the marathon before. We saw that today. It was uh, a, a special day, truly an, an honor to get to, uh, to be a part of it uh, with you guys. Uh, and for all of you at home uh, that, that chose to, to tune in from around the world, uh, to witness uh, this history so close uh, to, to, to breaking two, uh, we, we've turned the corner. I, I believe that we'll see this in our lifetimes, but uh, this was really, really, really something special. I think there are athletes sitting at home and around the world, and they are inspired now. I think it's going to be done. Yeah, as you said earlier, what's your two-hour mark? In whatever it is in life, what is that barrier that you would like to break? From Monza, my name is Sal Masekela. On behalf of our entire crew, thank you for tuning in to Breaking 2.